Can you beat Final Fantasy X-2 using the worst dress sphere combinations? That's right guys, we are back from flipping around in the woods of Connecticut and ready to give you another Final Fantasy Challenge Run video. Now I've done my research online and I've come up with three dress spheres which I believe to be the worst in the game. We have the Song Stress dress sphere and this one is actually a really cool support class. It has the ability to dance, which sounds kind of weird and it is kind of weird, believe me, it's kind of weird. So when this class dances, it can inflict status ailments on the enemies or buff your party members. And the abilities that they learn cost zero MP. The downside of it is they can't do much else while they are dancing. And if your party members die, they're just left there boogieing on down until they eventually die. Their stats are also very weak, but they do have some very cool techniques that cost zero MP. Coupled with a good offensive class, the song stress is actually super, super powerful but we don't have any strong offensive classes because the second class that I believe to be the worst is the White Mage. Once again, the White Mage is actually an awesome class. They have a super high magic stat and they have the ability to heal your party members, restoring their HP as well as curing any status ailments. You know, we all know the White Mage, we love her, she's great. But once again, coupled with no offensive types, we do have one offensive dress sphere and that is the Trainer dress sphere. And this one is pretty bad. The trainer kind of just does nothing. It has a few healing abilities and a few offensive abilities, but nothing that really stands out. The stats are also pretty weak, and then there are some other issues with the game to do with glitches that make this class quite difficult to use, and the just sort of janky nature of attacking with a dog. Yes, that's right, the trainer uses a pet to attack for them, so your party members can just sit around and chill while your dog does all the work for you. But the issue with the trainer is, of course, you don't actually obtain it until chapter 3. So until then, we're going to have Yuna be a gunner, because I believe the gunner to be the second worst offensive class. Again, no real useful techniques or abilities, pretty low stats. The only good thing about a gunner is the trigger happy command, which comes in very handy early game. And you'll see when we get the trainer how much we miss using trigger happy, because it is kind of a godsend. I'm not going to give too much away. I'm saying too much. Like, let's just get on with the run. Y. R. P. In position. It's showtime, girls. So our story resumes here, two years after the events of Final Fantasy X and somebody is impersonating Yuna, pretending to be a singer and putting on a giant concert in front of the entire Blitzball Stadium in Luka. It, it's, yeah, the, the story's weird, okay? So the calm has now been brought to Spira permanently, which means there's no threat of danger anymore, so the people of Spira just be kinda chillin'. And in this game, you're just kinda chillin', going around Spira with your new friend Pain and Riku from the previous game, collecting little video spheres, hoping to find out more information about Tidus and who he was and where he came from. So yeah, the plot is nothing crazy. There's nothing really too much at stake. It is more just about reconnecting with the people of Spira and finding out what they are up to two years after the events of Final Fantasy X. The story kind of takes a back seat in this game. The story is not important. However, I will still be giving you my opinions because there's a lot of crazy sh oh! And I do think this game gets a little bit too harshly critiqued on the story. And it's mainly because of the silly, goofy, girly nature of it. And I don't always think it's a bad thing that it's a lot sillier. The battle system and the gameplay in this game is actually super enjoyable. And as long as that is fun, I'm always gonna come back and play this game. But yeah, you're gonna hear more of my opinions on the game as a whole as we go throughout, spliced into some strategy and things like that. We chase the Yuna impersonator all the way down to the docks in Luka, where we are greeted by Lagos and Ormi. But wait, who's that shooting at them? Oh my god, that's Yuna! Holy sh**! That's right, Yuna has traded in her staff and white magic abilities for a couple of semi-automatic pistols and she is ready to kill some baddies. And then you have Riku, you've got Yuna, you've got Pain, and together they are... Europe. We take down the goons pretty easily because it's still the tutorial stages and then the Yuna imposter reveals herself to be none other than LeBlanc 
who is this person. She kind of acts as your rival throughout this game. She is also a spear hunter. As you are about to see here, Yuna is now transforming into her songstress and this is the only time you'll ever see me changing dress spheres in this entire game. And yeah, you can see the songstress here doing the darkness dance, which blinds the enemy while the other two attack her. I'm actually going to have Pain be the songstress instead of Yuna, mainly because I just think it's funny to watch Pain dancing because she's kind of awkward and a little bit moody. We are dragging the gr and that just makes it a little bit more entertaining for me to play the game. Yeah, that's all there is to say really about this battle. You'll be seeing much more of LeBlanc soon, don't worry. But let's continue on with the story. Riku. Once we gain control of our party again, it's time to move Pain over to the Songstress Dress Sphere. And after that, we are going to equip the items that we stole from LeBlanc and her goons, increasing Riku's HP and increasing Pain's MP. Our barkeep's a Hypella. No one knows his real name, so everyone just calls him Barkeep. No one knows his real name? What? Well, maybe you could ask him, considering he lives with you and works with you? Also, why do we need to announce that he's a high pillow? Why are we announcing people's race? I feel like this is the first instance of racism in this game, and it happens a lot, especially to the high pillow people, but also to Ronzos and Guados. It happens all around. Spira got some messed up issues. So uh, I'm gonna start a little racist counter right here. <laughs> Laugh while you can. I told you we'd be seeing more of LeBlanc, as the first real boss battle of the game is against her and her goons. Same as always, whenever we start these battles, we want to use Steel on Riku to get all the items from them. They have really useful accessories that we can take from them, so we might as well get all that done before doing anything else. You can see that I just used Trigger Happy. That starts a massive chain and becomes super helpful later on in the game. At the moment, it's still doing like zero damage because we have no strength yet. But as Yuna's level increases and she learns abilities like Trigger Happy level 2 and level 3, it will become much more useful. And yes, as you can see here, we are witnessing the Songstress version of Pain doing her little boogie that she does. It's kind of weird. She just sort of like gyrates her hips while lifting the microphone up in the air. Um, it makes me laugh. It makes me giggle. I'm glad that uh, I get to watch this the entire game. Be prepared to see a lot of uh, pain doing her little jiggle because she's stuck like this now for the rest of the game. I also gave the yellow bangle to pain, which gives her thunder and makes use of the songstress's slightly higher magic stat. Their magic stat isn't great, but much better than the thief and the gunner. Darkness is so effective against these guys, it just means that they cannot hit us at all. So we end up just using Darkness Dance for the remainder of the fight. Ah, you can also see she learned the technique Battle Cry. Uh, so the Songstress can also sing as well as dance, and when they sing, it gives you like a boost in stats. So Battle Cry increases your strength for the rest of the fight. And if Yuna or Riku could actually hit Lagos, then I'd be able to illustrate this point, but it doesn't seem to be happening. It happens several times. There we go. You can see there she did slightly more damage. And uh, yeah, that pretty much ends this fight. Da -da, da -da 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 -da. I right, hate this. We make our way to the top of Mount Gagazette looking for treasure and we make it to the top before LeBlanc does. Well, she does make it to the top but she uh, falls off the edge and we could save her but Yuna is not that girl anymore. She's done saving Spira so we take the muscle belt and then we equip the muscle belt giving us more strength and defense and then we also head over to Pain and give her the red ring and tiara. It comes! Okay, so this is the first real challenge of the game. Boris can deal some pretty good damage and cause some status effects which are quite annoying. So we start off every fight by using Battle Cry to boost our strength. That just makes it so that Trigger Happy can actually start causing damage. And then we go ahead and test out the new fire ability that Pain has. As you can see there, it did 118 damage. I believe Boris is actually weak to fire, which is why that does so much damage. And uh, yeah, you can see a problem here with the songstress. 
I have already locked in Darkness Dance and the other two party members are inflicted with Stop. And there's nothing we can do about it, we just have to sit here and watch as Pain Boogies until they are freed. Luckily, the Stop doesn't last too long though and they are free again, ready to attack. Uh, Boris is weak to Darkness, which is awesome, that's why we're using Darkness Dance. But he doesn't really use uh, normal physical attacks too often. Uh, his attacks still go through. But whenever he does that little claw attack, it misses because of the darkness. I say this is the first real fight. It's still pretty easy, to be honest. So I mentioned that this game is a lot sillier and goofier, which isn't always a bad thing. But uh, one of the silly, goofy plot lines they have is that Brother wants to f Yuna. And that is his cousin. That's weird. Yeah, incest is real silly and goofy. Love that. Love that that's where they went. Sicko! This is the first time I've returned to Besaid since my journey began. This is the first scene of the game that I actually like. It's so lovely to come back to Besaid after all the craziness we've just witnessed. You know, this game feels very familiar, and yet so unfamiliar at the same time. You're in Spira and you recognise the characters and the locations, but everything is very different. There's a less humble feeling to all the people around you. Everyone is no longer in fear or in danger, so everyone is just a lot happier and more excited and a little bit crazy. And coming back to Besaid and hearing the music and seeing the island, you really feel like Yuna is remembering her journey. Despite how different she looks, this is still Yuna. She still has the same heart and I think they do a really good job of uh, developing Yuna's character. I'm going to talk about it more as the game progresses. But yeah, it's just nice to see Besaid and Waka again. That's all I wanted to say. <gasps> Waka, a daddy! Daddy? This next scene with Lulu kind of best illustrates this growth in Yuna. Although she is the same person, she's not going to be a pushover like she used to be. There is a more like bad attitude coming from Yuna. But Yuna, never forget who you are. You're the High Summoner that defeated Sin. There are those who would use that, Yuna. I'll be alright. I won't let myself be used anymore. Not by anyone. Wow. That was so powerful. <laughs> After some story stuff, we head into this hidden cave that is located in Besaid. And we are then ambushed by this giant dinosaur creature thing. And this guy can be pretty tough. He has this like flame breath ability that hits all of our party members. So uh, as you can see there, it does a good almost 200 damage to most of our characters, which is a little bit scary. So we start off using Battle Cry with Pain just to boost our strength up and make the fight go a little bit quicker. And he is thankfully weak to darkness, so his physical hits will not be going through. We just have to worry about the Flame Breath attack. Luckily though, this fight is not too hard once he has been blinded, as he can't really do too much to us. We're just using some basic attacks from Riku and Yuna, and then using Darkness Dance with Pain. Not much to talk about, honestly. We, uh, we haven't really got into the meat of the game yet. The first chapter is just kind of learning the basics of the game. There's nothing too big a threat for you. And one of the really fun things about this game is learning the timing between attacks. So making sure that Riku's second hit gets off before Yuna's hit gets off so that she can do a two times chain and get maximum damage. So yeah, we just have one more hit here before he is dead. And then we obtain this new sphere. And guess what? It is our second dress sphere of the run, which is the white mage dress sphere. We go ahead and equip the white mage dress sphere to Riku because Yuna's already done that, you know, she's passed that life now, she's been a white mage, it's time for Riku to shine. Find anything? We sure did. Let's take a look. If you are enjoying this video, please do not forget to like, comment and subscribe as it just helps the algorithm, lets me know that you guys enjoy this content and incentivizes me to make more. I really appreciated the support I got from my last challenge run video and I want to make sure this one is just as good, so uh, send your boy some love. Aww. Aww. All right. After completing the mission in Besaid, we head over to the Thunder Plains and get into this battle with the Uchu. And I feel like this best describes how difficult this uh, challenge is. 
as you can see here, the white mage cannot really do much offensively. This this oak tree likes to cause confusion, and confusion in this game doesn't just make you attack other players, it makes you use items. So uh, you can see there, Riku just used a mega phoenix, which is like a massive waste. Like, those items are so hard to come by, and they come in so clutch when you need them, and we've just wasted it. So um, yeah, we just keep shooting her to, to get her out of confusion. Um, I did give Riku the red bengal so that she can now use fire. And uh, the white mage has a super high magic stat, so having early black magic spells is actually really good. It means that we can do some offensive damage. They also have incredibly low HP and defense, so they're hard to keep alive, and you have to balance healing with doing damage. And uh, eventually fire isn't going to be very useful. The red bengal doesn't allow you to use Fira or Firaga, so as we level up and go through the game, she can't rely on using these level 1 magic skills forever. We have to learn some other ways of doing damage with Riku. This fight is taking a while and confusion is just so bad. It just keeps uh, destroying our party. And then also uh, inflicting poison on everyone is hard. And this is just a random battle. This isn't even a boss. I think we're much too low level to be here. I, I soon recognize that and leave. But I just wanted to show you this fight to show you how difficult it is now that our party is a bit more set up. We make our way to the Mushroom Rock Road where we meet up with Maroda, whose face still is looking kind of f***ed up, like it just doesn't look right. Also, Yuna can somehow speak without moving her mouth. No problem. So that's a thing, I guess. And then we go and pick up this Garment Grid. And the Garment Grids are pretty cool in this game. They give you like an extra ability. So it means you kind of have free accessory slots because you have the ability that is given to you from your Garment Grid and then two accessories. And um, yeah, I go ahead and move the garment grids around a little bit so that we can change some accessories around. And I'm not going to be 100%ing this game. It's far too much. There's way too much to do. Like, I use a strategy guide for this walkthrough, and I didn't with my Final Fantasy X one. You can get away with it in Final Fantasy X, but in this one, you can just like miss very little things and then it ruins everything. You know, you miss out on an entire item that is really important for completing the game. So. No 100%, we're using a walkthrough. This game is convoluted as hell. Uh, we're not gonna go to every single area, every single chapter. We're just gonna do the important bits for the items that we want and for the fun story moments. But yeah, we're just rejigging around everybody's garment grids and making sure that we are changing their accessories and making things a little bit easier for ourselves, setting up for the future. As you can see, I have joined the Youth League to aid in the fight for a new Spira. I consider it my duty. Maven Nuge, our leader, has been hoping for an audience. Now that Sin has gone, people have decided to join a cult called the Youth League, and Lucille is part of that. The entire plot of this game kind of revolves around two different cults both fighting each other to be the dominant sphere of influence around Spira. I guess. I don't really know. Their their goals are kind of convoluted and not really explained, or I just don't care enough to listen. This game doesn't really give me an incentive to care about these two factions. I just know they're fighting each other and they're both mad at each other. Some members certainly have a uh, questionable past. The Thief League? What was that? Okay, James. Okay, now we're in the moon flow and we gotta help this duck called Tobley find his assistant. Oh, and he's I I guess this is why people hate this game because like, what the f is going on here? Like, Yuna has gone from, like, saving the entire planet from the scariest monster that destroys their planet every ten years to just, like, helping some duck run some errands. And, like, I, I get why people dislike it, but it's so camp, I can't help but love it. It's so ridiculous and stupid, like, why are we doing this? But well, why does it matter? Yuna wants to help a duck, let her help a duck, man. I find myself battling between, like, oh my god, this is so camp and stupid, I love it, to, like, this is actually just crazy. But crazy isn't always bad, it's just polarizing. And that's good, I guess. Oh, I don't know, it's a lot. This game is a lot. It makes me feel a lot of emotions and a lot of thoughts. I had many a thought playing this game of just like, do I love this or do I hate this? And I can never make up my mind. And that is what makes it so compelling to me. So we're doing another side quest here in Makalania. And we've got this fight against this magical elemental enemy and this giant shark. And as you can see, the only way to destroy the elemental is with water, and we don't have water yet, so we have to just use physical hits on it. But luckily we have a Silence Samba Dance from Pain, which just negates the elemental from doing any damage to us, and we can just focus on the shark. 
Yeah, the shark takes a lot of damage, but as you can see, we're trying to time our trigger happy and our thunder technique to get massive damage. And uh, eventually, it works. We get a pretty solid attack off and kill it. And now all that's left is the elemental. Uh, we do actually misclick and use darkness instead, so it's getting some hits out on us. But Riku can't hit it with any magic spells since she doesn't have water, so she can just pray away all of our damage. Prey is just a really nice move that heals us for a little bit of HP without using any MP up. And it's a nice little filler move. That's it? Never been this close to a celebrity before. Heading to the Jose Temple now, where we meet Gipple, who's like the leader of the Albed or something, I don't know. He's one of the three new boys that are around in well, Spirit. We're sort of control. leading these cultish groups, and uh, I'm just gonna say it, Gipple's kinda hot. We don't really learn too much about him compared to Nuge and Barilai, who are a much more central plot point to the game. Uh, we know that Gipple knows Pain and Riku because Riku's in our bed and he used to be travelling with Pain or something. But I wish we got to learn a bit more about him and hang out with him more because he's kind of sexy. And uh, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to know more about this dude and maybe even use him in my party. That could have been cool. Yeah, he just sort of tells us to go dig. And he's, he's, he's a part of the story. He's kind of important, I think, but like... I don't really sure remember much about him. He's We're just sort of like the, the third ladies. of the exactly heartthrobby boys that are in this game. And we see so much of Nuge and Barilite and they're just kind of really boring people and it's just annoying that they didn't do more with Gipple because like the dude's got an eye patch and a cool fashion sense and spiky hair. Like come on Square, like give me what I deserve, give me more Gipple. Also the name's fun, Gipple kind of sounds like nipple, you know, I'm, I'm excited, I'm intrigued, I want to know more and they didn't give me enough of it. Remember me? Oh god, not this fish-faced f again. So here's Isaru and he wants to know if we can remember him and of course we remember Isaru. How could we forget? I'm honoured that you remember me. Yeah, well, but don't be too honoured, alright Isaru? I still think you're weird as hell, okay? So Isaru failed his pilgrimage and didn't defeat Sin like Yuna did, so he's just trying to make money any way he can. And he's turned Zanakin into a tourist attraction for people to look at and understand the history of this place. And I think, why the hell not? I, I get why he would do that. You know, it makes sense to make profit off of your own trauma. He's probably quite traumatised from the whole experience. But I also understand that this place means a lot to you. It's where her adventure ended. It's where her and Tidus exchanged beautiful moments with each other. Yeah, this is quite a cool plot point. This feels like the natural progression of a place like this. This feels like this is something that would happen in the real world, you know? So yeah, this this is kind of cool. And, and I see both sides of the story. If you say so. The clues are Ki and Mon. Ki Mon? Now we're heading towards the back of Zanakund where we have this fight against a behemoth and uh, it's cool that you get to go to new areas but they kind of reuse assets all the time. Like this location is used several times and just like random places dotted around Spira. So although there are lots of new areas they all do just kind of feel the same but that's okay. Um, you can see here that we are doing a load of damage now to enemies like this. And this guy is very tough, he does a lot of damage, so I'm definitely using the White Mage here to heal rather than deal damage, and then allowing Pain to do the damage with Fire. And trying to get Fire timed at the end of a Trigger Happy combination isn't the easiest, but uh, when it works out it feels so satisfying to just see the damage rack up. Our adventure leads us to Killika, where we check on Donna if we can figure out how to get up these stairs. <laughs> and surprise, surprise, Donna is still a complete b There's the door. Use it. Jeez, okay, it's not like I've brought the karma or anything, you know, no, no gratitude, I guess. Who's that? It's around here that we meet Nuge, who is the leader of the Youth League, which is the cult that I talked about earlier that Lucille is a part of. And he's kind of cool, I guess. He's a bit of a daddy. He's got some like fun hair and a walking stick and glasses. Uh... Yeah, Nuge just kind of exists. He doesn't do anything for me and he doesn't do nothing for me. He's just there. Now we're running through the woods when we encounter this big scary guy. 
And this dude appears at the end of Final Fantasy X, so I was kind of shocked to see him here, just chilling in Killica Woods. Like, imagine you're just walking through the woods and you come across this ring. It would be absolutely terrifying. But, um, yeah, you can see our party are actually quite strong at this point in the game because we did a lot of side quests and running around. We've managed to rack up some levels and they're all looking pretty decent. Like, this guy is a challenge and does a lot of damage, but we're not in any real threat of danger. He does just take a long time to beat because of his high health pool and our small amount of damage. But uh, yeah, that body slam nearly kills Yuna, but it doesn't. And then another one of these attacks does kill her. I was a little bit worried about this fight, but not too worried. I wasn't sure how much health he had as well because it was taking a very long time. Our party is looking pretty nice. We are using Riku to heal up the party while Pain and Yuna deal the physical damage. And again, we are trying to time Trigger Happy with Fire. But that is of course quite difficult when Yuna keeps dying. Luckily we have Life Magic from Riku so that we don't have to waste any Phoenix Downs. And Life also just heals up quite a lot of HP. Whereas whenever you use a Phoenix Down, it barely heals up anything. Yeah, let's just move on now to the last boss battle against this giant robot dude at the Kilika Temple. And this is the final boss battle of the chapter. We've nearly finished chapter one. And chapter one is definitely the easiest. None of the battles here are particularly difficult. It's all about just learning the game and seeing how the battle system works. And this is quite a cool little way to end it. This uh, boss is just kind of random. We put darkness on it, but darkness doesn't seem to help against Haymaker. It still can kill us. But the regular physical attacks are actually affected by darkness, so it helps for that. And again, we are just using Yuna to do trigger happy, and we are using Riku to heal, and using pain to darkness the enemy. Whenever we are done healing ourselves up, we can actually use Riku's black magic spells. And we do actually eventually give up with putting uh, darkness on this guy because his most powerful attacks aren't affected by darkness. So we uh, go ahead, use some black magic spells, and then we use Jitterbug, which is pretty cool because it gives haste to Riku and Yuna. And Yuna's trigger happy command makes her ATB bar really long, so this Jitterbug ability is really nice. However, a downside of Jitterbug is that it also gives haste to pain, which means her dance lasts less time. You kind of want your song stress to be inflicted with slow rather than haste because it means their dances last a lot longer. So Jitterbug is like this weird dance that's kind of useful but only for a very short period of time. We also sing whenever necessary just to sort of like boost our stats a little bit. We do need it because we are just a little bit weak. We don't have much defense or physical damage capabilities. Honestly, defense is the best strategy for most of these fights because uh, we just need to make sure we are alive and doing little bits of chip damage until eventually they die. And you'll see this strategy proceed throughout the entire game. But eventually this guy does go down to a bunch of our techniques and we move on to see the final scene of this chapter. Just what do you think you're doing? Actually, we're spear hunters. So? <laughs> so that concludes chapter one. We have caught up with old friends, captured some spheres and met some new friends along the way. So tune in next week where the adventure continues and the plot thickens and gets weirder and crazier and yeah. My name's been Jamsack. Welcome back to part two of our video series where we see if we can beat Final Fantasy X-2 using the worst dress sphere combinations. And on the last episode, we obtained the awesome sphere from Kilika and after watching it and realizing it ain't that awesome, it's time to give it back. But who do we give it back to? Do we give it back to the Youth League or do we give it to another faction called New Yevon? And uh, it's really hard to decide and Brother's just out here doing the most. He does a lot of movements, he does a lot of things, he likes to move and groove around and it's kind of entertaining but it's just uh, it's just like weird. I just don't know how I feel about it. He does a lot. And, um, so yeah, we, we can't really decide. So 
like any normal person would, we decide to put on a concert. Yes, that's right. Yuna decides to sing and dance so that they can make up their minds, I guess, or something. I don't really know. I really gotta let off some steam. Just help us get our tie-dye exit. I were looking forward to being part of the show. I, I assume that's supposed to be Scottish. I don't really know. But we uh, push their lifeless corpses into the elevator. And then it's time for a concert. Yeah, let's hear it for you now, everybody. Woo! Find the note. Find the note. I bet this scene looked awesome in the trailers. Seeing Yuna and Tidus again and then like they're being shot at, it's like, whoa, what the hell? What could this mean? I can't wait to play this game to see what happens to them. And really, it's just like a dream that Yuna's having where it's actually just Len's memories that are being poured into her because of the dress sphere that she keeps using. Either way, it's a very cool scene and it's very nicely shot and it all looks very cool. And I do like it. It's a nice change of pace from all the stupid sh we just had to witness. But I can't help but want to play this game instead of this. La, 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 la. I feel like this is what was promised and this is what we got. But either way, it's still cool to see it. Well, it's got Yevon in its name. Enough said. But the Youth League is reckless. They're the ones picking the fights. So the time has come for us to pick which cult we would like to give the sphere back to. Which side are we going to go with? The Youth League or New Yevon? And Yevon in the past has already proven to be a pretty manipulative and unreliable source. But every time I play this game, I go with the Youth League because it's the obvious choice. They are clearly much more appealing than New Yevon is. But like I said, I always go with the Youth League, so I'm going to mix it up a bit and go with New Yevon. So we head on over to Bavel to give the sphere to Barilai. This is the sphere from Kilika Temple. After giving the sphere back to Barilai, he proceeds to tell us more about Vegnagan, which is like this giant machine that Bavel is keeping and it could destroy the world and something or other. And I'm immediately regretting my decision in giving the sphere to him because he's really boring. He just talks and talks and talks and I want to listen and I want to know more about the story in Vegnagan, but I don't care. And I think it's just because he is talking. He's just very, very dry and very boring. And uh, I don't really care for him. So, uh, we could have been hanging out with Daddy Nuge, but instead yes. we got to listen to this guy talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk until the end of time. But hey, at least we are getting a dysfunctional, organized religion back on its feet again. Because after the last game, I think that's what Spira really needs, is more terrible religious organizations corrupting the people and ruining everything. We are the good guys. Well done, Uni. You can pat yourself on the back. We've done a good thing, guys. New Yevon rocks. I'm Team Barilai. Change my mind again. Barrelize the best. New Evans the best. Peace and love to all. Peace and love. Peace and love. Peace and love. The main story is starting to bum me out, so we're gonna go and do some side content now. We're gonna head on over to Luca, where we meet up with our good old buddy Shalinda from the previous game. And if you don't remember her, I don't blame you, she's pretty forgettable. But she used to follow us around Spira and preach about Yevon and how we have to follow the teachings. She has grown a lot since the last game. They really, really decided to develop her character. She has gone from somebody who just followed people around and does what she was told to, uh, this. At first, I thought the best thing I could do would be to help the temples get back on their feet. But everyone just ordered me around. I made up my mind to leave the temple and come here to Luca. They needed people for this and they asked me to help. So, here I am. Another job you were asked to do? I suppose nothing about me has really changed after all. <laughs> Then we run around the Meehen High Road catching chocobos and then we have another boss battle against the chocobo eater from the previous game. And yeah, that is the thing about this game. They do reuse a lot of enemies from the last game. In fact, I think almost every single normal enemy is reused from the previous game. And a lot of the boss battles are too. And here's one of them. 
And uh, I don't really mind that, like this game is known to have a small budget and I think they just wanted to reuse assets and I don't see a problem with that. It's, it's fun and there's enough new stuff that I don't really mind when they reuse bosses but I can see why some people would have a problem with it. So we're just going around with pains, dances and seeing what we can use. It's immune to darkness but as it turns out it is not immune to slow so we are using the slow dance to keep it slow. Yeah, that makes sense. And while Pain is doing that, we are using Riku to heal us as Yuna does all the damage. And what's really frustrating about trying to get a magic spell at the end of a trigger happy chain is that you might think it's as simple as waiting for the bar to be full before using trigger happy. I like mine on the rocks. But sometimes they decide to just like speak. Like sometimes Riku will be like, I like mine on the rocks before she says Blizzard and like waits a good three seconds before casting it. And that's really annoying because it means you just can't type it. Sometimes she's going to speak and wait a bit longer and sometimes she won't speak. So like if you are ever playing this game just for fun, do yourself a favour and don't bother with any magic characters. Go with all attacking characters and like maybe one support. But like magic in this game is just annoying. You just want high damage dealing characters that can start big chains because they attack immediately. There's no waiting around. There's no cost of MP. And magic in this game, especially black magic, is just kind of useless. That, that's what I'm gathering from this playthrough. It really doesn't help us to have black magic, but we need damage and it's the only damage we got. So that's what we're using. Um, yeah, there's not too much to this fight. He can't do anything crazy like inflict us with status ailments. So we just heal ourselves and attack when possible until he dies. Oh yeah! You didn't really give the sphere to New Yevon, did you? What did you go and do that for? We're at the Mushroom Rock Road now and we have this boss battle against Elma. She is mad at us because we gave the sphere to New Yevon and she is part of the Youth League. And the Mushroom Rock Road has become like the Youth League headquarters. So I don't really know what Yuna expected in going here but it's actually quite cool that we get a boss battle with Elma. Because she's kind of just like a little side character in Final Fantasy X. And this gives her like a little moment to shine and it's cool that they went through the effort of rendering her even if she is just like a soldier with a different skin on like you can see she has like the same attack animations as these other soldiers but that's okay uh, sorry what did riku just say recharge! oh right okay she says she says recharge recharge okay she's saying recharge i literally every time she says that i have to stop for a minute and be like whoa i know this was 2003 but jesus why are we saying that anyway this fight Elma likes to use sleep a lot and slow, which can be quite frustrating, but we have Ezuna on Riku to get rid of sleep and Jitterbug from Pain to get rid of slow and give everyone haste. So once the two goons are down and it's just Elma against the three of us, there's nothing she can really do to hurt us. Yes, the status effects are kind of annoying, but they're easy to deal with. The important thing is that she's not doing too much damage to us. Riku and Pain in particular, the health pools are so low that a lot of bosses in this game can just like one shot or two shot them. Something I've noticed a lot about enemies is that they can attack multiple times very quickly. And Elmer is like a first example of this, where they just seem to get in a lot of attacks a lot quicker than we seem to. And it can be quite hard to recover. As soon as one goes down and you're having to use Phoenix Downs and life magic, by that point, the fight is almost definitely over because as soon as they're revived, they can use their next attack. You're back dead again. And this seems to happen quite a lot later on in the run. But for now, we're okay because Elma is super weak. And yeah, the fight is almost over now and we get a really nice chain off here right at the end. Final Fantasy X-2 introduces a lot of mini games and they're very hit and miss. Some are quite fun, but some are just like painfully terrible. In fact, most of them are painfully terrible. And this is one of them. We head over to the Thunder Plains because I was like, okay, there could be some cool items we can get. You have to calibrate these towers and there's a lot of them and you have to do it 30 times where you're just pressing the right button. So I do too, I give up and I run away. The next side quest brings us to the Calm Lands where we have the Chocobo farm and there's loads of fiends that are hanging around and we need to go clear them out doing this weird mini game where they're all like pointing at the imposter and then you find the imposter and then you fight them and then you do it five times and I don't know they, they are really stretching for these mini games but I thought this would be super easy these are not boss battles they're just normal fights that you're just supposed to clear and be done but turns out this guy is incredibly difficult the little wolf that has like the cool little tentacle thingies they have this death blast which just immediately kills us and like death in this game is terrible because as soon as you revive them 
they go back down again because they come back on very low HP. And this leopard thing is also immune to sleep and every other status ailment, so we can't negate it at all. So we need to get it dead, but we can't seem to get it dead because it also has very powerful black magic skills and it cycles between the two of them. It uses Firaga, then Death Blast, then Fundaga, then Death Blast, etc, etc. And there's nothing we can do about this, we just die. So this is our first game over to just a normal enemy. I, I, I'm shocked that we that we ended like this, but we try again and the same thing happens. And I'm like, oh my god, am I stuck? Am I, is there any way to defeat this guy? It has a really high health pool and I'm just not sure how to deal with it. On our final try here, we actually get super lucky. We stop dancing with pain so that she can use Phoenix Downs and healing items. And we also use more of Yuna's techniques to get his health pool down quicker and we actually win this fight. So that's our first two deaths on normal enemies. Too easy. Ah, uh, I think the f not, you trick ass bitch. We're now at Zanakund and we need to get these monkeys to f for some reason and we slam this one's face into a chest and i'm not even kidding when i say that this mini game took me 20 minutes to complete because you have to go between all the rooms up and down the elevator watching all the loading screens find the monkey that has the right name to match with the other monkey but it's all worth it in the end because we get the soul of thamza ring which is super useful for riku because it boosts our magic increasing our magic damage potential with the slight downside that it doubles our MP cost. We're so lacking in offense at the moment that we need anything we can get. So this is actually a super good accessory to have. The nerve! Yeah! Dude! What the fuck? Okay, main story quest time. We need to steal some syndicate uniforms from LeBlanc's goons in order to sneak into her palace and give her a back massage or no 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 we're looking for a sphere we're going to do it because we need to look for a sphere so to do that we need to fight Lagos and Ormi again for the 5,000th time and it doesn't stop there we fight them even more times the first two chapters are just about fighting Leblanc Lagos and Ormi they don't really change these boss battles are all kind of the same they just have higher health pools and slightly different attacks each time but they're all very easy and uh, you can see they're weak to darkness so it's pretty chill. And then I also discover that they're actually weak to sleep as well. So as soon as we figure that out, this boss battle becomes just a cakewalk. And uh, there's nothing really that they can do to us. A lot of their attacks go through darkness. So sleep is just much better because it means they can't do anything at all. So we are free to use our crappy black magic spells and shoot them in the face until eventually they both die well they don't actually die they just run away they never die because um that would be kind of that'd be kind of cruel yuna's not murderer she's just uh she's just a sphere hunter except for all the other people she murders she she does murder all of these people no problem anyway the fight is over we won and we collect our first syndicate uniform but it doesn't stop there we still have two more to collect so you guessed it we go back and fight them again pick up the second syndicate uniform and then we go chill out in the hot springs where we collect the third syndicate uniform. And after all that hard work, they're like, you know what? Let's strip down to our bikinis and just enjoy the hot springs for a bit. On sacred ground? Is this scene relevant to the plot? Not really. Is this just shameless fan service? Yeah, it kind of is. And this game in general is just a lot more sexual than the first one. There's a lot of like shots. Although, to be fair, the first game was actually quite sexual now that I think about it. A lot of FMVs show off Lulu's or Riku's. It's kind of just embedded in this series to, like, over-sexualize the women in this game. There's a demographic of people that enjoy this, so why not? It is kind of annoying when you have these strong characters and you're just, like, unnecessarily sexualizing them. But at the same time, they have been fighting very hard and doing lots of stuff. So like, maybe they do want to get in their bikinis and have fun splashing around in the hot tub. Uh, you know, it, it's not too out of character for them to do something like this. So I kind of don't mind it. It's hard to have an opinion on it because I don't want to just overtly just say because something is sexualized that it, it is wrong, you know? Because I feel like that's a common critique about this game is that it's just like way too fan servicey. And I think there's a good balance of fan service in it. It is just like a lighter toned fun game. So is it wrong that it's a bit more fan servicey? I don't really know. It's uh, up for debate. So let me know in the comments what you guys think because I think it's a very interesting debate and I'd be interested to hear what people think about it.
Of course, brother is getting horny over the thought of them splashing around in the water. And that's one thing I do have a problem with because it's like his sister and his cousin. Like, why has he got this obsession with his cousin? And I guess it's supposed to be funny. Can he not just have a crush on Pain instead, someone he's not related to? But whatever. The scene is over. Riku is getting pruny, so it's time for them to get out. And now that they have all three of the uniforms, it's time to sneak into LeBlanc's palace. <laughs> So the disguises are working, and nobody knows that is Riku, Yuna, and Pain in these outfits, and Lagos and Ormi instruct us to go and tend to our duties, which uh, obviously means we have to go and give LeBlanc a sexy massage. <sighs> okay, I take back what I said earlier about the fan service being like a good balance, because this chapter is just one after another, hot spring followed by back massage. Like, I get it, the game developers are horny, and it's just like... <gasps> How many times are we going to have to do shit like this? But we do it, and failing it is actually better because we get this heady perfume accessory, which is really good because it has HP and MP stroll, and it boosts all of our stats. So this is like a perfect accessory for our white mage, which we use for like most of the run now. So uh, yeah, very, very handy. Ah, the gold wings! Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Oh my god, are we fighting Ormi? I would have never have guessed. It's not like we've done that five times already. Ah. Oh lord. Again. Yes, of course, we fight him once more. And he's a bit stronger this time, but we defeat him quite easily. And you guessed what's coming next. We fight Lagos. Again. Nothing new, nothing changed. Same old Same old fight. And again, he goes down quite easily. Slightly stronger, but no match for the goal wings. And then we have a fight against all three of them. And this is actually quite challenging. And it is, in fact, the last time we will ever have to fight them in this run because they become our friends after this, which is quite nice. Um, we've learned Scattershot for Yuna, which is like super handy because it just does damage to all of the enemies. So um, we're just using that until we run out of MP because we might as well. It does more damage than our regular attacks do. In the past, we just used Sleepy Shuffle or Darkness Dance to negate them, but they're immune this time, so they've learnt from their mistakes and they are wearing accessories that makes them immune to that, I guess. Um, and yeah, they've got some really cool moves. You just saw there, she used like this tornado thing and then Lagos shot at us. Lagos also has this Russian roulette type attack where it can like cause instant death or poison or just like do not a much damage at all. It's like a random effect. And uh, this fight's cool, it's just a shame that all the other fights against them were so terrible. The strategy for this is just to use Carnival Can Can move because it doubles our HP. It's really good, if there's ever a boss fight that's just doing too much damage to you, you can go super defensive, put Protect on everyone, use Carnival Can Can to double our HP, and then heal us with Riku. And that way it just means that we're not going to randomly just die, which is awesome. It's a fight that gets easier as it goes along because once Ormi is down, it means there is less damage coming. Then Lagos goes down. And because we were using the scatter shot, it means that most of them go down one after another. And when it's just LeBlanc left, she can't do much to us. This will be the final time that you see us fighting. The, the, what are they called? Do they have a name to them? I think they're just called LeBlanc and her goons. This will be the last time we fight LeBlanc and her goons, which is great. Because uh, I don't know about you, but I was getting bored of it. This chapter has just been fan service and LeBlanc. Fan service and LeBlanc. Fan service and LeBlanc. And it's finally coming to an end. LeBlanc does have shell and protect on. And Trigger Happy is still doing a decent amount of damage. But Riku's Blizzard is barely doing anything at all. And we're getting to that stage where the level 1 magic spells are just not really doing it anymore. We need a better way of doing damage. But the fight is over, and LeBlanc is now part of the party. Yay! So we head on over to Bevel to confront Barilai and see what's going on with Vegna Gun. A girly man like that doesn't stand a chance without his escort. Whoa, I don't like the way you said girly man. What's wrong with being a girly man? Also, Lagos, check yourself, mate, because you ain't particularly a shining example of masculinity. Enough of this nonsense! But regardless, we are sneaking into the depths of Bevel to see what is happening with Vegna Gun and to like put a stop to it, I guess. Watch the exit. I don't take orders. But 
But I'll make an exception this time. Leave it to us, love. Okay, so we have these series of puzzles that we have to do with these like spinning plates that lead down to some platforms and I'm following a guide and it's telling me which ones I need to use um, to get the ribbon accessory which is super handy because it means we're immune to all status ailments well most status ailments there's another accessory later that makes us immune to every status ailment but I want to get it so I'm going round and I have to fight all these bosses and it's really nice because these bosses give you lots of experience and uh, this guy here who you fought in the first game, again, it was that big creature in Baj Temple. It's really weak to reflect because it only uses level 3 black magic skills and it uses them three times on all of our party members. So we just cast reflect on our party and it all gets pushed back onto him. Which means it's actually really easy and it's just free experience which is nice because we are quite weak. I haven't really done any grinding whatsoever. So uh, our party isn't particularly strong and we're using very bad dress fits, remember. So this is a nice way to gain some levels while also gaining a really important accessory. Yeah, look, you can see, look how much our levels are going up. Uh, right, pearl necklace. Like, this game doesn't even try to hide how, like, gross it is sometimes. Did not expect this, though. So I've been running around fighting, like, six of these plus a bunch of robots. Like, I've been running around for ages killing these monsters. And then I get an oversoul version of this guy. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. He just has more health. Should be okay. He's just going to keep using his uh, level 3 black magic spells. Nope. I was wrong. He can use physical attacks now. And he's very quick. And uh, we're dying very quickly. And I'm like, oh god. I haven't saved in a while. And I really do not want to lose. Because it means I have to go through all the cutscenes again. Which you can skip. But it's still annoying. I have to go through all those bosses again, look through the walkthrough to see which spinning plates I have to activate. And I'm like, okay, let's see if we can survive this. Uh, everyone is going down. Um, I used an effer and uh, yeah, Riku, Riku ate the dust. And, uh, and I actually rage quit after this because I was kind of mad. I woke up the next morning feeling fresh and ready to go and we don't get any oversoul versions of this monster and we do the puzzle again and I'm feeling calm, I'm feeling ready, everything is going well and as you can see there all the platforms are lined up nicely and we go and collect our ribbon accessory, yay! And it's, it's super handy because the status ailments in this game are quite a challenge. There's also the bloodlust and the ring in this area which we do another puzzle to get and these items are insane the ring is particularly quite nice it gives us haste and it poisons us and it drops our defenses a lot but it also increases our magic loads and gives us access to all level one magic abilities so i give this to riku and i'm like let's see how this goes and uh here we are in a fight against barrelai I didn't equip the Bloodlust because it's quite similar to the ring, but it gives your party member Berserk, which is not nice. I'd rather be poisoned and have haste than have Berserk and haste because Berserk means we cannot do anything. We have to just attack. And that means Yuna will only ever be able to attack. And I don't really want that for her. Riku being poisoned, not too big of an issue. Although her health is very low now and she dies quite quickly because of it. Yeah, I didn't expect Barrelai to be this hard. I, I went into this fight not being very prepared. And he's very, very quick. Like, he's just chucking out attacks and spells, like, 24-7. And we can't seem to get any turns in. Every time I revive someone, someone else dies. And then I'm just constantly trying to get our HP back to a normal level. I'm using so many items. I haven't been able to put Protect on anyone because our MP is being drained and everyone keeps dying. So I just went into this completely unprepared and uh, I need to retry it. So after Pain dies, I make the conscious decision to just murder Yuna. I just start shooting myself, but he uh, inflicts stop on me. So even when I try to KO myself, I can't even do that. He won't even let me KO myself. Goodbye, my sweet hairy prince. So we're just sitting here patiently waiting for him to stab me. And then he does and we get another game over, but... Uh, that's to be expected. And I'm not too mad this time. I don't rage quit because there is a save point nearby. So I just hop back into the fight again. And this time I'm going to make sure that our defenses are covered. He only ever used physical attacks. So I make sure I put protect on everyone with Riku. And then I sing with pain to use the, the Cantus Furnace. Is that what it's called? Cactus Firm? 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 The Firm Cactus. 
Cantus Firmus, that's what it's called. I use the Cantus Firmus to boost our defenses even more. And now I'm feeling ready. I'm going to make sure that Riku is constantly healing and that we are using Trigger Happy to get as much damage out as possible. Jitterbug to just make our ATB bar fill up quicker. There is that attack that reduces our MP to zero, which is a problem if he targets Riku, which of course he does. We just use an Aether on Riku whenever her MP gets drained and that will bring it back up again. And yeah, he's still doing a lot of damage to us. This isn't easy now that I've used Protect. It's still a challenge, but this is going a lot smoother. Everybody is alive at least. And as long as we have unit alive doing damage, it should be fine. And he doesn't actually have that much HP and he goes down quite easily. So that was much easier the second time around. Now it's time for the final fight of the chapter and it's none other than Bahamut. Well, more specifically, it's Dark Bahamut, which um, if you remember from the previous games, the Dark Aeons were like the hardest battles in the game. They were super, super challenging. But in this game, they're just like normal story bosses. And it's a little bit of a cop out. You have to fight all of the Dark Aeons. And you can tell it's just because they wanted to reuse assets from the last game. They had all the models for it. They never really explain why the Aeons turn evil and decide to attack you. And also why Yuna can no longer summon them. I guess because the Faith all went to sleep. But if all the Faith have gone to sleep, then why are the Aeons back at all? Unless these are like made by new yevon uh, as like weapons i don't know maybe they explain it and i forget but whatever we have this fight against bahamut and he's actually super easy i make sure to put shell and protect on all of us but well, he's not super easy but his uh, mega flare attack which i thought would be the most deadly is surprisingly not too bad at all it's actually impulse that does the most amount of damage to us because it doesn't seem to be affected by protect or shell so i don't know if it's magic based or or physical based or if it's just based off of our level or hp total i'm not sure but that seems to be the move that gives us the most issues and he counts down to mega flare so you know when it's coming up and you know to heal to fall whenever it does come up but surprisingly it doesn't do too much damage thanks to our shell we're using Carnival Can Can as a way to increase our max HP, doubling it and making sure that Mega Flare can't do too much because I wasn't sure what it would do. So here you can see he's about to use Mega Flare. I'm expecting big numbers because it's a big scary attack. And uh, look at that, all the crazy particle effects and explosions and it does like nothing, which is just mad. I don't really know why it's like that, why <laughs> Impulse does like almost triple the amount of damage that that does maybe even quadruple but yeah mega flare is not an issue and this fight isn't an, an issue it's just a slow process using trigger happy and blizzard or fire or whatever level one magic spell we have makes this super easy we're trying to time it again with our trigger happies making sure we use trigger happy and then following up with a blizzard at the end of the chain but that doesn't always happen because Bahamut will interrupt with Impulse or Riku will speak again and we just can't seem to get the timing right. But at least we know that we're not in any real major danger. Having haste as well on Riku now is so handy. I'm not sure if the ring is actually worth it because the drop in HP and defense is very noticeable and Riku dies very easily. But it is very nice to have haste on her constantly. And having her magic increased as well means that our healing spells just do so much more and heal us to full all the time. And it also means that whenever she uses her black magic spells, they're doing a lot more damage. And damage is the thing that we are lacking. So that's why I equip the ring. In any other circumstance, I wouldn't bother with the ring. If you're just doing a normal playthrough, leave this item alone. The, the downside is far too dire. And um, you don't really need the magic boost. If you are a black mage, you would have learned Faraga and Fundaga by now. And you can just do big damage like that. You don't need the super boost that Ring gives you. Because the downside, it's just, it's just far too much. The poison is not even the worst part. Poison barely affects us at all. It's just the drop in HP and defenses. On a character like a white mage that already has terrible defenses, cutting all that by half and minimizing it just means that you're going to die very frequently. But yeah, for this playthrough, it's necessary, I suppose, just because we really do not have the damage that we need. And I'm hoping to get him down before he uses another Mega Flare here. You can see he's weak, he's about to die, but he's counting down to his Mega Flare. And I'm like, okay, 
we can do this. And we do. That's Bahamut dead. Nothing. So the reason we were down there was to look for Vegnagun, and Vegnagun isn't there. It was just Bahamut. So where could he be? Where on earth is Vegnagun? And why is there this giant hole in the middle of Bevel? Well, I guess we'll have to find out next time because that ends our chapter. Tune in next week where we fight more Dark Aeons and find out more secrets about Vegnagun and continue our adventure to find out about Tidus. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name's been Jamsack. Welcome back to the third part of this series where I see if I can beat Final Fantasy X-2 using the worst dress sphere combinations. So chapter 3 begins with the disappearance of Nuge and Barrelite and Gipple and that has sent Spira into chaos. But before we do all that, first things first, we need to head over to Mount Gagazet to collect our trainer dress sphere which means we can actually start doing the run, yay! Before this, we've been using the gunner, and the trainer, in my opinion, is just way worse. So we head over to Mount Gagazet, speak to Kimari, and grab the trainer dress sphere. We immediately equip that to Yuna, and then I'm like, while I'm here, I might as well do the mission that is on offer. So in this mission, we need to stop this Ronzo called Garrick, who's trying to kill the Gordo or something. And before we get there, we have to climb up the mountain, and I have this fight here against a Gemini and this little robot-y flicky thingy. And I've sped it up really quick just to show you now that the battles are much harder. The gunner is very, very missed because the trainer here can't do very much. We've just got the trainer class, so we have no abilities and we just have this dog and the agility is super low and the attack power is not very high and we have no cool techniques like trigger happy. And you can see here the Gemini is just wrecking us to pieces. Like we, we stand no chance and we do actually get a game over against a normal enemy. So that is our fifth game over now. So this was a nice reality check to me to make me realize that I need to step up my game. So we retry and we actually killed the Gemini this time. Ronzo, hold anger no longer. We've made it to the top of the mountain and now it is time to stop Garrick from going to battle with the Guado. Typical Ronso. Good point, but I was talking about uni. I mean, if I was being spoken to like this, I'd be angry too. Pain and Rico are literally like, yeah, typical Ronzo being angry. And it's like, well, yeah, if you're telling them that they're angry, they're going to get angry. Anyway, the battle begins and I sped it up more than I usually do. And the reason for this is because this is by far the longest battle that I do in this entire game. This battle went on for ages. I think it took me like 30 minutes in total and I did not expect it to be this hard but these guys cast mighty guard so they have protect they have shell on them you can dispel them but he will just use mighty guard again uh, they can get rid of your MP they can cause loads of status effects luckily they are weak to darkness so as long as pain is using darkness dance they can't do too much damage to us but we also cannot damage them mighty guard also casts regen on them and our attacks are barely doing enough to get through the regen as you can see there Riku using her black magic skills is doing like 46 damage which is terrible because regen can heal them for like 157 damage and Yuna's attacks are not doing much better either only averaging out at about 115 damage and the regen goes off quite a lot so you can see the problem we're having here our damage output is not penetrating their healing output also, they keep using blind on us, so we have to keep curing the blind. And every time we have to cure blind, that wastes more turns, which means their regen can get more off. So I guess the thing to do would be to dispel it, which we can do, but then that uses MP. They also have an attack that reduces our MP to zero. So we have to keep restoring our MP, getting blind off of us, doing damage, casting dispel, and it is just insanity. It's so boring because there's no real challenge here. It's just very, very long and boring. Luckily, Pain has the ribbon technique, so she's immune to all status ailments anyway. But blind doesn't affect her because she doesn't attack. It's just whenever we get blind on Yuna, which happens more than I would like it to. I didn't actually know this, but now that the run is over, I've realized that Pain's singing techniques can stack up. So if I were to have kept using the battle cry, which increases our strength, 
it would have been easier, but I didn't know that because the game doesn't tell you that. I assume that you use Battle Cry once, it gives you a little boost in attack, and then that's it. I didn't realize you could keep stacking it and get like massive amounts of attack or defense or any stat that you want. So, had I known that, this would have been a lot easier. But I have trimmed this fight down a lot for you guys because it went on way longer than this. Once the two guards go down, and we're left with just Garrick. It actually goes on for so long that he runs out of MP and that's the only way we manage to win the fight is because he can no longer cast Mighty Guard on himself. So um, yeah, f f that battle, that was awful. It was so boring, so tedious, but we got through it. Before continuing our side quests, we give Pain the Shining Bracer accessory, which gives her a constant protect effect. And then we head off to Luca, where it's time to play some Sphere Break. Uh, that's very disturbing. We're playing against a dog for some reason. And Sphere Break is actually quite fun, even though it's like maths related. Like once you get the hang of it, it's kind of cool. And there's some cool garment grids we can get. You're going down. After defeating three opponents, we then have to challenge Shinra, who's the champion. And we lose to him and he's like, no, I want to keep the Sphere Grid. It's my dress sphere. And it's like... Okay, you don't even fight. You literally just sit on the computer all day. What are you going to do with a dress sphere? But it's fine. We don't need that dress sphere. We got what we wanted, which was the garment grid, which gives us mug, which is really cool. And we equip the garment grid to Yuna so that she can now steal items as well as attacking, which is awesome. And we do eventually change this and give it to another character, but not quite yet. Here we are in the Mihen High Road against these enemy robots. They have a lot of health and they are weak to water, which means we have to suffer through Riku saying this over and over and over again until the mission is over. And at this point, I'm starting to lose the plot just a little bit because I'm noticing that the trainer is so glitchy. Every time we go to attack, it will just start running in circles and attacking thin air. And it takes like twice as long to do an attack because your ATB gauge is not filling up because your dog is too busy running around and not attacking. And then the fight is, it's just too much. It's just too much. It's very frustrating, but we do the mission. We head on over to LeBlanc's palace to do some more stuff or something. I don't know, who cares at this point? I'm so frustrated and tired with this game. I just want it to be over, but we have to listen to like this. <clears throat> oh, LeBlanc, there's nothing to worry about. What the f is going on in here on this day? What are you doing? Oh, Something that always really bothered me about this game, and I know it's very nitpicky, but LeBlanc lives in Seymour's old palace, and I think it's a good fit. It, it's like extravagant and crazy, and it matches LeBlanc's personality, you know, and it's okay that they're reusing assets, but like, why are there still pictures of all the old Guados on the wall? And how did LeBlanc even come to purchase this palace? Like, it makes no sense. Is she like super rich? Why does she get to live in Seymour's old place? And you'd think her moving in with her sort of extravagant style, she would, you know, take down some of the pictures of the old maesters and put pictures of herself or Nujup. Her bedroom looks like it belongs to her. It's got all of her emblems on it and things like that. So why does the rest of her palace not? Chasing after spheres of my Muji Wuji isn't there to smile. But anyway, back to the story. Uh, LeBlanc is a bit depressed because Nuge has gone missing. And Lagos wants to take us to his chamber to show us this special sphere that might be of use to us. And the voice actor for Lagos is very odd and I've just realized who he sounds like. Meet us in our room. We'll have a little screaming. That was smashing. After messing around with LeBlanc and Lagos, I then head to the Calmlands where I pick up these sprint shoes, which is an awesome accessory that I give to Payne as it increases her agility and also allows her to cast haste. So it just gives her like a little bit of extra utility. And now it is time to head to the Cavern of the Stolen Faith where we are tasked to save these tourists that have gotten stuck in the cavern. And the fights here are actually quite difficult. I didn't expect this. I've got this battle here against uh, Crimea and the giant Flan. And the, the Flan is pretty easy. We can put him to sleep, but the Crimea seems to be immune to like everything. And they're also doing like a lot of damage. So I start off by trying to get rid of the Crimea. Stop saying that! Since I know that the Flan can just be slept, I think, okay, we'll focus on the Crimea. And uh, turns out he's he's very powerful and he kills Riku and Yuna, which is an issue because 
pain is stuck in her dance and then she can't do anything until her dance is over and then she gets KO'd and we have another death on our hands. We retry the mission again and it's quite a long mission, you have to save quite a lot of people and then eventually you end up in the cavern of the stolen faith, faith area where you obtain Yojimbo and of course Dark Yojimbo is waiting for us. And I did not know what to expect from this. I figured, hey, we defeat one Dark Aeon, we defeated Dark Bahamut, so this should be a cakewalk, right? And uh, not quite. It uses Kozuku, cause nope. It uses this attack which drains our MP, which is a bit of a problem. And luckily his other attack barely does any damage, especially with Protect Up, so I'm feeling pretty confident that we can beat him. He also has a dog, much like Yuna, that's cool. Maybe they can be little dog friends. Um, they don't seem to even acknowledge that each other exist, which is uh, a, a shame, I suppose. So yeah, he then uses his Zanato attack, which, and if you remember this from the previous game, this attack instantly kills us. So I'm thinking, surely it's not going to do that again. And thankfully, it doesn't. But it does reduce us to one HP and one MP. Like, what are we supposed to do against that? That's, that's insane. Because like, as soon as that happens, we have to fight for our lives, but he gets in more attacks before we have a chance to even do anything. So I don't really understand how you're supposed to do this fight. That just seems impossible to me. You'd have to have your potions ready as he does his attack and like to plan that is just nuts. So yeah, you can see here we're struggling to get everyone back on their feet and it's looking like we're going to get a game over. And of course we do. And I'm like, it took me so long to get here. There's no save point nearby and this is an optional boss. So I decide to leave because I can't be bothered, you know? I could waste loads of time trying, but I don't need to 100% this game. If it's not necessary, I ain't doing it. So we move on and make our way to Besaide, where Shinra is setting up some comm spheres. And he does this all over Spira, and it's basically just like a little Skype device. And he puts it on the ground, and we can watch what's going on. And it's one of these weird little plot points that adds in midway through the game. And it kind of goes nowhere. You can watch these comm spheres, but like, what's the point? You can just go and visit these places. Oh, I can see Yuna! Obviously, we have to throw in a gag about brother getting a boner over his cousin because that's what this game is all about. And um, yeah, she gives him a little wave and that sends him skyrocket and he wants more, more hand action as if he doesn't see her waving every day on the airship. Who is that? His name's Beckham. They say um, actually, I think you'll find his name is Q and he happens to be the star player of our goalkeeper only team in Final Fantasy X. And if you want to check out that video, the link is on screen right now. Go give it some love. Regardless of this man's name, he wants to burn down the temple because there are fiends coming out of it. And Waka's like, no, you can't get rid of the temple, it's our tradition. And he's all like, well, we don't need them anymore. Yevon's a lie, right? So it's up to the Gullwings to defeat the fiends and save the temple. Wouldn't want you to overdo it, Daddy. Daddy? And surprise, surprise, we have to fight Dark Vale for. It's kind of weird that we fight Dark Bahamut first and he's like one of the easier ones because he's one of the last day on you get and he's a lot tougher than the rest. As you can see, our dog is glitching out straight away, which is great. <laughs> and uh, then it misses. So I start off each fight just by increasing our defenses and strength and things like that with pain. And then I'm using Holy Kogoro from uh, Yuna. And this is really good. It does holy damage and it just does like a nice chunk of damage to the enemy. And that coupled with Dirty Dancing, which makes sure that we always do critical hits, means that we are maximizing our damage output. Dirty Dancing plus Holy Koguro is what saves us through a lot of fights. It's like the best way we can do damage because we don't really have many other options. Riku is also there to cast fire whenever she can, but most of the time she's just gonna be healing in this battle because Veilfor does a lot of damage very quickly as well. He's a very fast enemy and he gets out a lot of overdrives. You can see here his first one, Energy Ray, doesn't do too much damage to us. We can survive it quite easily, but it's Energy Blast that I'm scared about because that one I know can do a lot of damage. So I'm using Carnival Can Can, which doubles our max HP. And I'm using that instead of Dirty Dancing, just until I know how much damage we are going to take from Energy Blast. You'll also see that Yuna keeps missing a lot in this fight, because uh, the trainer accuracy is not very high. Sonic Wings knocks our MP, which is quite frustrating, so we only managed to get in a couple of Holy Koguros before we're just using Yuna's basic attacks again, which don't do too much damage, but 
at least it's quick and it doesn't use any MP. And now you can see here Energy Blast is coming out and it does a lot more than Energy Ray does, but not too much. We're also missing quite a lot of attacks, so I use Pitch Perfect to increase our accuracy, hoping that Yuna can land all of her hits. And then I go back to using Dirty Dancing because I'm confident we can survive any attacks now and I just want to get this fight done. So for the last stretch here, I go ahead, use Carnival Can Can and just start attacking with Yuna. He gets in another energy ray of course, but I ain't too bothered. It doesn't do too much damage to us. And then after a couple more hits, we win the fight. This game is rather predictable and a little bit repetitive. It's like, yeah, you go to Besaid, you fight Valfor, obviously you go to Kilika and fight Ifrit. And then of course, after that, we go to the Jose Temple to fight Ixion. And it's like, I, I, we could have seen that coming. That's very obvious. And uh, I know this game has a small budget, blah, 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 blah. But it is a little bit of a cop out that they just make you fight the same enemies over and over again in chapter two with LeBlanc. And then in chapter three, you're just fighting all of the Aeons again. It's like, can we get something new? Like just a few things. It's very rare that we get any new enemies in this game. And it's like, they just sort of had the assets and then sort of had to try and make the storyline fit around it, which means the story wasn't the priority, just making money was. So they just reuse stuff. I don't know. You know, it is just a sequel, but like it kind of ruins the lore of Final Fantasy for me and almost kind of cheapens it in a way for me. We had such a long goodbye with all the Aeons in the first game and now they're just back again and are evil and it's like they didn't give it too much time to develop it just sort of happens because they wanted to have you fight them because they had the assets and yeah it just feels kind of cheap to me let me know what you guys think in the comments about this do you think it's cool that they brought back the aeons or are you on my side where you think it's just a little bit lame right rant over let's get on with the fight so Ifrit is weak against ice because he is fire. So luckily in the last battle against Valfor, we learned Koguro Freeze, which does like physical ice damage to an opponent and has a chance to freeze them. But um, most bosses are immune to that part, but still doing ice damage is nice. So Yuna is mainly gonna be using Koguro Freeze. And then with Pain, we're just using her to boost all of our stats and give each other regen. I gave her a garment grid that gives her regen so that she can just have a little bit of extra utility. And then Riku is just going to cast Protect and Shell on all of us so that we are taking less damage. Because once again, Ifrit gets in quite a lot of attacks and is quite a powerful foe. And we don't want to die because as soon as we start dying, we start losing. So you can see here, all I'm doing with Pain is boosting our stats using all of our stat boosting abilities and then using Kogoro Freeze with Yuna several times just to do more damage. As soon as I feel like we have enough stats boosted, I then change to use the Dirty Dancing Dance from Pain. As you'll see here, Kogoro Freeze does over 2000 damage when it's a critical hit. Pain hadn't used her Dirty Dancing technique yet, but seeing that number, I was like, yeah, we gotta start doing some critical hits because uh, that's pretty powerful. 2000 damage at this stage in the game is nothing to sniff at. So you'll soon see here that we use Dirty Dancing and now our attacks are gonna be doing more. And this combo is awesome. Like I already said in the last battle, now that I've discovered this, it kind of carries us through the rest of the game and made me realize that actually this, this playthrough is definitely possible with Dirty Dancing. It's a very, very powerful dance. But now that the battle is over, it's time to learn more about Yuna's hole. Another hole. The holes? No. The holes? A great hole. That's true. The holes? Yes, deeper connections. Oh, that is deep, Yuna. An Aeon? <laughs> yeah, Riku, an Aeon. Why do you sound so confused? Like, we've fought five of these already. Yes, there's another Aeon in the temple where you find the Aeon. Like, duh. Why is why is this such a surprise to you? This game sometimes is just ridiculous. Like, who wrote this? Why didn't they just make them go, oh my god, here's another one. Like, it's stupid, but like, why do they make her seem shocked that there's an Aeon in the temple where you find the Aeon in the first place? As if we haven't just been to every other temple where the Aeons are and found an evil Aeon. Like, duh. But like, whatever. I don't know why I'm getting so mad at this. I'm just frustrated because this chapter is starting to drag and become very boring and predictable. Nothing has really happened except going to the temples and fighting. And it's just like, I want better from this game. I want something fun and interesting. And this this chapter is not giving it to me. 
Anyway, sorry, this fight, the, the strategy is the same as always. <laughs> we are using Holy Kogoro this time and Dirty Dancing, which is doing like around 1700 damage, which is like really, really nice. Yeah, Aero Spark is a bit of a problem. It does a lot of damage and I can't really tell if it's magic damage or physical damage because Shell and Protect don't seem to protect from it very well. So who knows, but aside from that, we're looking pretty good. We have Protect on, we have Shell on, so nothing can really hurt us too much, apart from the Aero Spark and its Overdrive, I suppose, if it ever gets that off. We run out of MP very, very quickly with Yuna. Because Holy Kogoro does 18 MP and the trainer doesn't have much MP because they're not really a magic using class, it makes it a little bit tough. But the trainer does actually learn a technique that is half MP cost. It takes a very long time to learn it, but as soon as we get that, we are looking very good because that just sorts us out immensely. I think it costs like 200 ability points or something to get half MP cost ability, which is like ridiculous. That's one of like the highest in the entire game, but it's very worth it once we learn it. Now, Ixion is using Four's hammer and this is their overdrive. So I'm expecting big damage. We do have show on, so I'm not sure if it's going to kill us and okay. That's fine. It doesn't do too much damage. That is with Shell though. I think without Shell, we would have been in trouble and this would have been tough. Obviously, our dog just runs around in circles like it always does because it's stupid. We keep missing as well and Aero Spark comes out again. Again, it's like, I'm not sure if it's protected by the Protect or by the Shell. But I believe that Ixion is one of the more defensive Aeons, especially compared to Ifrit and Veil 4, because it's just taking a lot longer than the other fights. But luckily he doesn't do as much damage, it feels like. I feel like we struggled a lot more with the damage in the other two fights than we do in this one. And maybe we're just stronger, I don't know. But yeah, he, he's, uh, his defense is higher because our Holy Kogoro is not doing as much as it used to. And it's just got higher HP points as well, because it seems to just be taking a little bit of a long time but I'm not worried I feel like this challenge is definitely doable now now that I understand these classes a lot more and what they're capable of it's definitely looking like this run is going to be a success and I'm very happy for it but uh will it be easy I'm not too sure because the difficulty does ramp up quite a lot when we get to the end and I'm not doing a lot of the side content so when we get to those last few bosses you're gonna see uh how underpowered we feel it is definitely a challenge I'll say that so um, although it seems kind of easy now, the challenge will ramp up in difficulty as time goes on. But yeah, that is Ixion defeated. Hallelujah, we have killed three of the Aeons. And uh, now it's time to find another hole. Oh my gosh, more holes. And just as our heroes are peering over the hole, they notice that Ixion isn't actually dead. And it actually comes into the room and explodes on them, causing them all to jump. But Yuna can only jump one way and she decides to go straight for the hole and... Uh, falls to her death. Oh, I feel so bad for you. Are you okay? Just kidding. She doesn't actually die. She gets greeted by Barrelai. Oh god, what a great thing to wake up to. And they are going into some other big hole inside the hole that leads to another hole. Um, yeah, they're, they're in the far plane, which is where this hole leads to. And Nuge and Gipple and Barrelai are all down there. And they're like, oh, hey, Yuna, did you jump in the hole too? Here's some spheres that mean something to do with plot. Yeah, Give it too. to Pain. Uh, we were friends once. That's a plot point. Pain is so underused. Uh, she's like friends with these guys or something, but like they never give us again an incentive to care about that. But yeah, they've all decided to team up and go into the hole to find Vegna Gun because these holes need to stop, man. There's just too much hole going on. But now Yuna is all alone in the dark, but there's a little figure that keeps whistling at her and she's like, Tidus, it must be you. I'm going to follow you. And this light takes her up. And then all of the sudden she's out of the hole and she's back in Bevel. Yeah, she fell in at the Jose temple, but then she came out in Bevel, which must mean the holes are all connected. <gasps> yeah. Oh my gosh, that's I'm really on the edge of my seat. I cannot wait for the next chapter when we find out more about the holes and what the boys are up to in the holes and I'm gonna stop saying holes now and leave it here. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name's been Jamsack. Welcome back to the fourth part of this series where I see if I can beat Final Fantasy X-2 using the worst dress sphere combinations. And oh boy, you are in for a treat this episode because this chapter is very short, it's very story heavy, and there's a lot of crazy stuff that happens. 
And our story starts here with Payne, where we are finally learning a bit about her backstory. She has been with us the entire game, and the game is nearly over. This is the second from last chapter, and we're only now finding out about her past. So the story is that she used to be friends with Nuge and Barrelai and Gippel, and they were all a squad in like the Crusaders, and then there was an accident where everybody died and then they went their separate ways and never spoke about it again. And it's a shame that we only get this disposition now. Payne has been in our party for so long and she's got a very cool design, like I love Payne's design. She wears some of the cooler outfits in my opinion, of all the dress spheres, but her story is just so weak. We really don't get much from her and I get that she's a bit more quiet and a bit dark and moody, but even when she's telling us this story it's just like, okay is that it? I would much rather they show some of her story rather than just tell us and the story doesn't really make much sense. She says there's an accident where everyone dies and whenever you ask her what happens she says nobody got any answers, nobody knew what happened, none of us ever spoke about it, people died and then we moved on and we haven't spoken since. So it's like she has no idea what the story is, nobody else knows what the story is, we just know something happened. And I think there was such a missed opportunity there. I don't understand why we didn't find out this towards the beginning. You know? Like, why wait until now to tell us this? She's been in our party for this entire time, and she's, like, supposed to be a friend of theirs. So why do we only find this information out now? And I just wish they developed her more. I wish there was more to her story. Maybe she could be connected somehow to, I don't know, Waka or Lulu or even Tidus. Have some sort of connection somewhere to just sort of, like, make it feel important that she's with us. Because it doesn't feel important. Yes, all these sub-characters that we've come to know, she's connected to them, yeah, but that's just not enough. I don't know, it's just like everyone else in this game who's in the Gull Wings has been part of the team since Final Fantasy X, and I just wish that she had a bigger connection to them, because it just kind of feels like she's tacked on as just like, oh, we needed like a gothy emo chick, so we'll make one, you know? And they didn't really think too much about who she is or why she's even there. That's just my rant on pain. I, I still think she looks cool, if anything, so... You know, there's that. Now, I think the reason this chapter is so short is because they expected us to use these comm spheres a lot more than I do. So basically, Shinra has been around Spira and dropped these little spheres off and you can access his computer and view all of the spheres to see what's going on around the world. But it's just like, I don't care. Like, why did they implement this? Like, this whole game is about going to different places in Spira and seeing what's going on. So why do we need video footage at this point in the game of people when we could just fly there and see what they're up to? Like, we've been doing that the entire game. It makes no sense. Like, did they just want us to get more shots of people's... Like, am I just doing this so that I can have the thrill of being sat on Donna's bed and staring at a giant... I don't know. But, like, that's what it feels like. I, I, I don't understand what the point of this was and like maybe they just assumed people would be way more invested in this story but I I am just not. Every single chapter I have been to visit these people so why do I need to do this? Like I want to play the game, I want there to be more gameplay, I want to have more mini games or battles or like more dress spheres, something like don't give me this content. Like I... I know I'm sounding like unnecessarily angry for like a game that's supposed to be kind of silly. But like this must take up a lot of space on the disc, right? You know, they could have used this space to do something better. But instead they just thought it would be interesting to do something like this. And it's like, there's only so many times I can stare at Walker's without getting bored, you know? Like this is not fun for me. Are you sure about that? Whatever. The comm spheres are dumb. We only check like a couple of them. And then we leave and go and do the rest of the mission. There's no side missions in this chapter, it's just main story stuff. So the comm spheres are all we are getting in terms of side content, so let's continue on with the story. Basically, Gipple and Barrelite and Nuge are still missing and there's the threat of Vegnagun coming and destroying everyone, so they need to come up with a plan. The Gullweeds need to think of something to do. So what can we do? What the heck are we supposed to do? All of Spira will be the captive of you and Sing. 
Oh my god, duh, like of course we're gonna throw another concert, like what else would we do? That seems to be the only solution these people could ever come up with. They're like incredibly powerful fighters and instead of fighting things they go, you know what? We just need to put on a concert because that's all Yuna can do. Yeah, she may have saved the world once with her incredible white magic skills, but nope, we're just gonna sing our way to victory because that always helps. I, I, I sh you not like this game, like what, what, what is this? Why is the solution to everything to throw a concert? It makes no sense. They never did this in Final Fantasy X. So why now do they always just think about throwing concerts? And it works. The annoying thing is it works. And it's actually a really cool scene where we get there. But like, why is this the solution they go with every single time? I feel like I'm losing my mind because it's just so ridiculous. And I love it. It's great that they do this. It's so hilarious. But I don't think it's supposed to be as funny as it is. But my god. We now need to prepare for the concert by going to the Moonflow and finding Tobley because Tobley has access to some instrumental things and I, I don't know, he can help us with the concert. We need help from the duck. We helped the duck earlier and now the duck is coming back to help us. And like, what concert would it be without a talking duck, you know? So yeah, but we're gonna go track down the duck and uh, we have this fight here against some enemies in Moonflow. I'm just showing you this to fill in some content and show us how strong we are because uh, these fights ain't really much of a problem to us. We use Kogoro Freeze and it actually works. We froze the opponent so now we're just straight up chilling. He can't attack us. We're looking pretty strong and uh, the secondary effects that Yuna have on her Kogoro do actually come in handy quite a lot. It's a nice added bonus to the trainer class. I don't know how often you see enemies be frozen besides using the uh, stop command. Good boy! <laughs> okay. Ride the shoe puff. No, 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 that's not right. Everybody knows it's said like this. Ride the shoe puff. Also, where on earth did they get some of these voice actors from? I don't suppose he climbed into one of them trees, do you? Like, why does he say it like that? That's so weird. Like, th this chapter is making me lose my mind. I don't understand anything. Why did he say it like that? It's so weird. Oh, the duck fell out the tree. Of course the duck fell out the tree. We gotta go catch the duck now because he's running away. And, uh, and we soon catch him and then it is time to practice for the dance. So we have this little rehearsal with Riku. Oh, ooh, yeah, we're dancing. You know, press the buttons, press the buttons. Dance, 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 dance. And shots of crotch, shots of crotch, dancing, 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 pressing buttons. Am I doing this right? Is this correct? This this doesn't feel correct, but maybe it is correct. We're just pressing buttons, pressing buttons. Keep on pressing dances, la 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 la. We're dancing, dancing, dancing. I'm gonna win, gonna win, gonna win. And we're gonna win. We're dancing, dancing, dancing all the time. Gonna dance. Ah, high pillows in my face. Dance, dance. 386, that's actually a very high score and I literally just mashed every single button possible. But getting the high score is really good because it gives us the smooth shaling accessory. What? 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 Smooth shaling, what does that even mean? Sorry, what? Do you think this is going smoothly? Sorry, can you can you say that again? I, I don't think I heard you. Do you think this is going smoothly? Are you saying smoothly? Is oh, that for God's you... sake! You never even listen to me! I'm so done with these stupid coffee dates! Wait. I don't even like girls. The smooth shaling accessory is actually perfect for pain. It's basically a ribbon, but with more immunities than the ribbon has. But the downside is it gives you slow. With the song stress, you kind of want to be slow because it means your dances last longer. So slow is not a debuff at all. And paired up with an accessory that gives her first strike, it just means we can always get a dance off straight away. 
and it lasts for a long time. That's really cool because when the dance ends we can immediately use another dance so the slow never really affects us which is awesome. This this accessory was kind of made for the songstress which makes sense because you get it dressed as the songstress while you're doing a dance challenge thing. But what are you gonna sing? Um... <laughs> She's really good. Now we are ready to head to the Thunder Plains to clear out some fiends so that we can host our concert. And we have this enemy here who does a ton of damage to us and we are barely doing anything to him. Like you just saw there 100 damage from Yuna and like 30 from Riku. So uh, this one's looking quite scary and then Body Slam destroys pain. And I'm like, okay, maybe he doesn't have that much health, but you know, it, it, I'm sure it's, I'm sure this is just like seemingly harder than it actually is. So I give the fight a go. I'm like, what have I got to lose? I'm here. I try using Dirty Dancing because I'm like, we just need to get him dead quickly, I think. And then you'll see here, Holy Kogoro does 3400 damage. So you can see how high his defenses are. Our regular attacks are doing barely anything. Like we have to use Dirty Dancing to get through this fight. And even then, like, Two Holy Kogoros haven't killed him. So I don't know how many it would take to actually kill him with a critical. And then Riku and Pain die. So I'm like, right, I'm just going to escape to save another game over. Boss battle time. And this guy hits like a truck. You can see there, 822 damage to Pain. Yikes. So before the fight has even begun, Pain is just dead straight away. I couldn't even get out a healing spell. I couldn't do anything. There was... Nothing in my power could have prevented that. So I'm like, oh dear, this isn't going to be easy, is it? He has this flame breath attack, which does like nothing. It's just his physical hits that are really, really uh, scary. But I need to get protect out. And I can't get protect out because everyone keeps dying. But as soon as I have protect out, I feel a little bit better. I know that at least we can survive. And uh, uh, survive is a, a strong word. I put shell on us just to negate some of that fire breath. But it is his physical hits that are doing the most. And again, he's getting so many attacks in so quickly. Like every time I'm trying to stabilize, it's just like, boom, I'm down straight away. I mean, you need to be very quick and you need to be lucky as well. You need Riku to just sort of start off with a full ATB gauge using Protect. I'm starting to realize that perhaps my uh, accessories aren't the best. At this stage in the game, it just feels like we are dying too easily. And it's mainly just because of Riku's ring um, accessory. The ring is super handy, but the HP being as low as it is and the defenses being as low as it is, the enemies are just too strong at this stage in the game for an accessory that's so bad defensively. Glad to see my dog is happy that we died, but I am not happy because it means we have to try this again and go through the dungeon all over again. And the dungeon isn't too hard, but once again, my dog just loves to run into nothing. Oh, I love this class. Trainer is the best. Mm hmm. Yep. Great. Love that. So here we are trying the fight again. And I die again, of course. And, uh... It's around this stage where I'm like, okay, something needs to change. I'm going to mix around the accessories and I remove the ring accessory and replace it with the tarot card accessory, which just increases her magic. So we no longer have haste anymore, but we also don't have poison and our defenses also haven't been halved. But it also means we can't use black magic spells anymore, but I don't think we need to. I think it's okay that Yuna is our only damage source at the moment and we just need Pain and Riku to be there to support Yuna. I think that is the best way to go about it at this stage. I think early game I needed extra bits of damage, but now I just think we need to pump the hell out of Yuna, make sure she's super strong and just let the others protect her. I've, I've started to realize that a defense is the best offense. As soon as our defenses are covered, we are sitting pretty. So we have two classes that can sort out our defensive while Yuna just dishes out the damage. And once we have protect and shell on us and things like that, we can just heal with Riku and use Dirty Dancing for pain to get the maximum amount of utility out of everyone. A combination of Holy Kogoro, Dirty Dancing and some powerful healing spells means that I'm feeling a little bit more confident. Regardless of that, it still hits like a truck and we still keep on dying. And Riku runs out of MP very quickly and uh, also HP very quickly because she keeps on dying. It's, uh, it's a problem. I feel like I'm supposed to be stronger than I am. Maybe I was supposed to be grinding in this chapter, but like, I just haven't been. 
And I don't want to grind. I don't want to just grind for levels because that's boring, you know? And it kind of just takes the challenge out of it. I like to just see if I can breeze through the game and take on every challenge as it comes. Because like anyone can just grind levels. I feel like this game is possible if you just get to level 99 and use whatever class you want. But I want to see if I can just do the game normally using terrible classes. So um, that's why I don't grind too much. Again, we're having to use a lot of uh, resources just getting everyone alive again. And now Riku has run out of MP because I keep using full life because uh, there's just no point in using regular life. And the reason for that is that it just restores your HP to a very small amount and then you end up just dying straight away again. So at least with full life it may cost a lot of MP but it just means you're more likely to, you know, survive a turn or two. And it gives us enough time to get Protect out because there's nothing more frustrating than bringing someone back to life trying to heal them up and then getting protect on them only for them to die in the middle of it and having to redo all of that again. So full life just ensures that we can do that. And we have enough ethers, so I'm not too mad about using them. I'm usually really stingy with my items, like I never use items, I'm just scared of running out of elixirs and mega elixirs. But in this run I, I become a bit more like ruthless with it and I decide to actually use them. Because for some reason whenever I play these games I just like hoard them. I'm just scared that like I'll need it in a desperate situation and not have it. But these are desperate situations. This is a hard boss battle. I can't get through it. So I should use whatever items I have necessary to get through it, right? I'm also casting regen on people just as like a little bit of extra healing potential, you know, just to give people a little bit of a boost. Do as much as I can do to, uh, you know, ensure a victory. I'm also casting haste so I don't have to use jitterbug. Pain is the one who keeps dying, unfortunately. Now that Riku's defenses are sorted, it's uh, pain that we need to worry about. Because she's being a pain. It's in her name. <gasps> Ooh, she rhymed. That was a rhyme. Didn't even mean to do that. I don't I don't write any of these when, I, when I'm speaking, by the way. This is all just me watching footage and just saying whatever comes to my mouth. To my mouth, to my brain, and then comes out of my mouth. Um... But you don't care about that, and no one, no one, no one cares. No one should care. I am obviously running out of things to say as we get towards the end of the fight here, but it's looking like it's probably going to be a victory. In fact, I know it's a victory because I've seen this footage before, and there it is. The final blow comes out. We are victorious. One thousand years ago, before the time of sin. Now everybody is gathered in the Thunder Plains, which seems like a very dangerous place to gather lots of people. But, um, you know, regardless, that's that's where they chose to have the concert. And Yuna is giving a speech about how Spira used to be so divided thanks to war. And then Sin was born and we had to deal with Sin for so many years. And now Sin is gone and we're still in conflict with each other. Like, have we not learned from our mistakes? I honestly think Yuna should just be president. Like, what is there that she can't do? Does she? Why does she not just rule all of Spira? You know what I mean? She should be the one making decisions. She's the only person in this world who makes any sense, who has a clear mind, and has also like saved everybody's lives countless amount of times. And she's an incredible pop star singer. Like, hello, make her prime minister, president, whatever, whatever they decide to choose in this game. But our hearts can and should always be one. I'll be honest though, this isn't the best speech ever. It's a little bit floaty and a bit fairy, you know, a little bit just like, we should all be together and let's all be friends again and love will always unite us. And it's a nice message, but like, she's just not being very um, poignant about it. She's using a, bit, using a bit of like airy fairy terminology. I don't know if that means anything to you guys, but it makes sense in my brain. And now we have, whoa, good graphics time, FMV. And I don't know if I'm allowed to play this scene because it's uh, probably copyright song. But this actually kind of slaps. I mean, the song is like, whatever. Like, it's not something I would listen to. It's nothing groundbreaking compared to some other Final Fantasy tracks that have used real vocals. This one is, is not very good. But it is so early 2000s, like everything about it just like encapsulates that era for me. And I can't help but just find it kind of iconic and uh, just funny. It's just funny hearing Yuna singing a ballad about love and stuff. But it's like it's shot very well. It, it looks very crisp. It's like an emotional scene. And I said earlier about like why would they gather everybody in the Thunder Plains for this concert? Because it's quite a dangerous place. And it's because it just looks really cool in an FMV. Like yeah, it's a cool setting to have a concert. So that's why they wanted to do it. Who cares if everybody gets struck by lightning if it looks cool, right? And um, you can see here now Len is possessing her body 
because she's using the dress sphere or something and she's turning into Len and oh my gosh, her memories are pouring out and everyone can see it and they're in Xanakin now. Why are they in Xanakin? I don't know. And uh, oh, oh, there's Vegnagan and her singing has the power to show everyone this, I suppose. It's probably not actually happening. It's all just like the emotions and the feelings of the song, you know, shown through a visual way. And here's Len. Len looks really odd. There's something about her that just looks strange. It's like, you know if she was like a mum of two. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? She looks like she's she's a mum. You know, she's she's had some kids. There's just oh, she just gives off like mummy vibes. <laughs> and then Shuyin is kind of like Tidus if he was like an ex coke addict. <laughs> you know what I mean? She's like a mum and she just wants a simple life. But her husband is always out doing coke and she has to try and be like, come on, you have kids now, sort your life out. And he's like, but I love cocaine. Um, that's just the vibes these these two characters give me. It's Yuna after two kids and Tidus after crack. Well, I didn't say crack, I said coke, but let's go with crack, why not? So yeah, this is like the reveal that, ah, all those memories Yuna's been having, they're Len's memories, yes. And Len and Tida, uh, nope. Len and Shuyin were lovers, and uh, they had something to do with Vegnagan, and then they were shot and murdered. And now Len is like, I need to get back to my love, so I'm going to haunt this dress sphere and hope that whoever takes this dress sphere will bring me back to Shuyin, because Shuyin is still sort of alive but in the far plane and causing a bit of a problem, being a bit of a menace. And she's like, I need to stop him, but I'm trapped inside this sphere with all the outfits that I wear when I sing songs. And do you, do you hear what I'm saying? Like, this game is actually nuts. Like, I don't actually, like, I'm pretty sure that is the plot, or that's how I have interpreted the plot. And you kind of just have to accept that nothing really makes sense. You just go along with the ride. And that's what Final Fantasy is all about sometimes. And I don't mind that. I'm, I'm okay being taken on a wild journey that makes no sense. I can suspend my disbelief for a bit of, you know, girly fun time. The emotions when she sung has all come to her, all the floods of memories of Len. She lets out a little tear, and it's a really nice end to probably the most chaotic chapter of this entire game. Twas a magnificent melody, Lady Yuna. The onlookers yeah. were all... I don't care. Okay. I don't... I, I really don't give a fuck. Boys, we're going to the far plane. <laughs> You heard it right guys, next episode we will be heading into the far plane to save the boys, kill Vegnagan, and finish the game. It is the last chapter next episode, so uh, thank you for joining me on this crazy ride that it was this episode, and um, yeah, my name's been Jamsack, Welcome see you guys back to the fifth and final episode of this series where I see if I can beat Final Fantasy X-2 using the worst dress sphere combinations. And it is time to tie up any loose ends in the story. And we start off here in Besaid, where Waka and Lulu have finally had their baby, yeah! But uh, unfortunately, it is Ginger, which means it's probably going to look like Waka, which is very unfortunate for the child. You think so? And then when you head over to the beach, you meet Becklam, and he's about to leave the island for some reason. And I don't really know why we needed this story closure from a character that we literally met last chapter, very, very briefly when he wanted to burn down the temple. And he gets like this big send off as if he was an important character. So uh, that's cool, I guess. Glad, glad we got that. Ah, oh, he's got Blitzball. Keep playing Blitzball Q. You did a, you did a great job. Sorry. I ran into the cave in Besaid just to see if there were any cool items I could pick up and then I got myself into this battle here against the Corel. And if you remember this enemy from chapter 2, this is the enemy that gave us our first death. And I just want to show you how far we've come in this run because uh, he does not pose as big a threat as he did all that time ago. We use Koguro Strike with Yuna, which is an awesome technique that just instantly eliminates an enemy. It just shoots them off into the sky and now this battle is an absolute cake. Walk. Kimari told me something once. He said, only those who try will become. Okay, so now we're imitating their voices. That's kind of like the spirit equivalent of putting on a black scent, which is uh, very 2003 of this game, if you know what I mean. <laughs> then Kimari said, Kimari think Riku should stay Riku. Huh? 
If even Waka the raging racist is confused by your racist comments then that's an issue right? But we've nearly closed off this chapter in Besaid and they will tell you several times that Waka is struggling to come up with a baby name. What's his name? Naming my son is my first important decision as a parent. Pick a name for your baby. I gotta come up with a name. Say you picked a name yet? No, I haven't picked one yet. We now find ourselves in Kilika, where the fighting has finally come to an end. Yuna has made sure that there is peace in Kilika, and everyone can go to the temple again and have a lovely old good time. Even Bartello and Donna have managed to settle their differences, and she decides to turn into a red balloon. Good for her. Finally, the game is literally about to end and we can only now just play Blitzball. So let's see what Final Fantasy X-2 has decided to do with the Blitzballs. Oh, uh, mm. what? What is what is going on here? Am I am I missing something? So in this game, instead of playing Blitzball, you just kind of hire recruits and make them train, and then you just watch them play, which is so boring. Blitzball had its problems in Final Fantasy X, but it was really fun getting to go around Spira and find players and like actually get to play with them rather than just sitting there and watching it all happen. And uh, I'm, I'm super disappointed by this. And it happens right at the end of the game as well, which is kind of sad. And another thing with the Blitzball in this game, whenever you're not playing a game, you have to watch the other teams play. And like, you watch this footage and tell me if you can decipher what is even going on. Oh my, like the, the screen is moving so fast. And like, am I supposed to be reading this text in the corner? How am I supposed to read this? Like, wh what is happening? This is terrible. This is awful. But it's okay. We don't have to play Blitzball. We're running away and we're heading to the Mushroom Rock Road where we are tying up loose ends with uh, Yable? I'm sorry, have we met this man? I hate to say it, I hope I don't sound ridiculous. I don't know who this man is. I mean, he could be walking down the street, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know a thing. Sorry to this man. Maybe I forgot to do a certain mission where this guy was important. Maybe he was in Final Fantasy X and I completely forgot about him. Or maybe I was just taking a massive and didn't actually pay any attention. Either way, I'm glad to see he's doing well, I suppose. But now let's head over to the Jose Temple where we need to beat up this giant machine to get a special dance for pain. And we haven't upgraded this machina by doing any digging, so it should be easy, right? Okay. So that's another death on our hands. This time I go and change our accessories a bit to be a bit more defensive and I've re-equipped the ring and I've decided that I just don't need it in this run anymore. The ring is out permanently and we swap it for a shining bracer that gives Riku the constant protect effect. And then I go ahead and change some garment grids over for pain, just making her a bit more defensive. So as I previously mentioned, I haven't been to the Beaconel Desert to upgrade this guy, which is a good thing because this means that this is the easiest this boss will actually ever be. He is at level zero and at level zero, all he can do is physical attacks to us. And yes, he hits hard, but I know how to deal with physical attacks. We can use Protect with Riku and Cantus Furnace from Pain to reduce all damage. Obviously, if I had known that Cantus Furnace could stack then I would have done that several times, but I didn't know that at the time because the game doesn't tell you that and uh, I find out all this information after from you guys in the comments, which is lovely. Uh, it would have been nice to have known that perhaps while I was doing the run, but that's my own fault for not doing more research, but hey ho, that's okay. We live and we learn. Well, do we ever learn? I don't know. I'm probably going to do another challenge run where I miss out lots of information, but I'm only human and I'm not a very clever human and uh, I'll admit that and that's okay. We all, we all have our own faults and mine is in being a clever boy. Um, so yeah, I'm using Carnival Can Can to increase our max HP just because I'm a little bit scared and uh, I don't want to die. And we're just using Holy Koguro with Yuna to get the damage in. And once we're all set up and we've got Protect and we're healing and we're doing all of that lovely stuff, there's nothing that can be done. We're pretty much invincible at this point. Well, not really invincible, but it'd be very hard to lose at this stage. And that's how all these fights go. The beginning parts are the most scary. If we don't set up quickly, it is just like death straight away. Death to all of them. Oh, 
But if we manage to just set up correctly at the beginning of the fight, we're fine, you know? And that's what we managed to do in this. We went in and we realized that we needed to do something to change, and now we've done it. And um, yeah, once again, I've said it once, and I'll say it several times. Defense is the best offense with this specific dress sphere combination. Because the defenses are so weak from Riku and Pain, we really just need to sort that out first, and then Yuna can just act as a massive damage dealer. And as you can see here, the fight doesn't go on too long until enough Holy Koguros knock it out. But it's not over yet because we need to do some more digging to upgrade this guy and beat him again if we want to get the song for pain. Here we are in Guado Salam where Trommel has learned the power of being a leader through music or something. I don't remember this being a plot point. I don't remember Trommel wanting to be a leader or him ever even interacting with the little woodland bands that are usually in the Macalania. They are, they're, they're telling him he's a great leader because of his music and everyone's happy and that's, uh, that's, it's, it's, it's lovely. I'm so happy that we got this closure that we needed. I'm, you know, I want the best for everyone in Spira because I love them. Um, especially Trommel, he's sexy. I go ahead and move Riku onto the Treasure Hunter Garment Grid and that allows her to use Mug which means we can start a chain off with Yuna and then I go ahead and give her the Okra Ring which gives her Lightning Eater and allows her to cast Fundaga and then I go ahead and give the Tetra Bangle to Yuna which allows her to absorb all elements and the reason I do that is because we have this boss battle here against this giant scary beast in the Thunder Plains and I'm here to just pick up some cool accessories and stuff that this guy drops. And yeah, this is quite a challenging fight. And I know they cast Fundaga, so at least Yuna and Riku can protect against that. And uh, the Tetra Bangle is an incredible item. Being able to absorb all elements means that one character just doesn't have to worry about magic damage, which is incredible. And Yuna's the best fit because her magic defense is a lot lower than the other two characters. And we want her to survive because she's the one doing all the damage. And yeah, you can see here, Fandaga comes out and that is lovely. They absorb it and Pain is the only one that takes damage. So we just have to worry about one character. Of course, that's not all this guy can do though. Oh, far from it. It would be much too easy if he just cast Fandaga. And he uses moves like Uppercut instead, which deal big boy damage to us. And it's quite scary. Nothing we can't handle though. And uh, I try to get Mug off whenever there's no healing that needs to be done, just so that Riku has a bit of utility. And it means that we can time it with Holy Koguro to get off more damage. So uh, giving Mug to Riku instead of Yuna was a much better idea, because we're mainly using Holy Koguro, so Mug was never being used on Yuna. And it just is a much better fit. Pain will always be dancing, so there's no point in her having Mug. But when there's no healing to be done, Riku needs to be doing something. She may as well be starting chains and stealing valuable items from our enemies. The fight seems to be going well. We're managing everybody's HP well enough. But then it moves on to this phase where it starts to use Tyrant Tail. And this move pushes back our ATB gauge, which is quite frustrating because it means it takes longer for us to get our powerful abilities out. And it doesn't do too much damage, so I'm not too worried, but the pushback in ATB is an issue. And obviously our MP keeps on running out, so we have to keep on restoring it with an effort. And just as we do that, we do it at the exact wrong time, where it gets out another Tyrant Tail, wiping out Riku and Pain. And I'm like, yikes, when did this happen? Like, the fight was going so well. And then Uppercut comes out, killing Yuna, and it's just Riku alive. And I'm like, she cannot handle anything. Luckily, he seems to be going for Fundaga, which is great, because it can heal her up while we get another player up using full life. And of course, we choose Yuna just because her HP is higher. And I'm like, okay, we've stabilized again. This is fine. We are not going to lose this fight. It is going well. Of course, it uses Uppercut again on Riku, and she dies. And that means the high potion that I was using on Yuna has now been wasted. And Tyrant Tail is doing a lot of damage because we don't have Protect on anymore because of the KO. We have to get Protect back up again, but before we do that I have to make sure everyone's alive. But he keeps using these powerful attacks and killing everyone, and we just cannot survive this fight without Protect. Like, we desperately need Protect. The only break that we get in this fight is if it uses Fundaga, but as you can see there, it doesn't. It goes for another Tyrant Tail, giving us another game over.
I think we just got pretty unlucky in that last fight, so I retried the fight without really changing anything and just to see if we get some better luck. So I start again by using Dispel and then as the fight goes on it gets closer and closer to the end and it's looking like we're going to win. We do pretty much the exact same thing as we did last time, he just doesn't use Double Tyrant Tail and we kill him with a Holy Kogoro. But it's not over yet because if you know this enemy you know he uses Meteor before he dies and for some reason it attacks everyone except for Yuna, she just comes out of it unscathed and we win the fight. Nice and easy, I guess. And that is the mission complete there, but we are not done yet in the Thunder Plains because we need to head into this cave to save our Uncle Sid. So this is another reused asset from Final Fantasy X. We already beat up this machine in the last game and it was that thing that did the big mana beam and counter attacked us and it's, it was one of the longer fights in the last game, I remember that much. And this time he has these little watcher things floating around, which he did have last time, but this one just stops us from using certain techniques. I don't know how it does it or why, but I just know we need to get these down straight away so that we can actually start the fight. Because at the moment, a lot of things have been blocked for us. And it's a bit of an issue because I want to use all of our lovely techniques. And I can't right now. I'm trying out some dancers that aren't doing anything. Um, I'm just, you know, testing out what I can use. Uh, apparently the Okra Ring was a terrible mistake because Fandaga heals these guys instead of doing damage to them. Which is a weird change they make in this game. So in the previous game, Funda was always super strong against any Machina type enemies. But in this game it heals them, which I guess makes sense, like if you're pumping electricity into uh, a machine it's only going to make it stronger. But I guess the idea in the previous game was if you pump too much electricity in it, it causes it to like overload and explode. So that's why I was weak against it. So I see the case for both. I think it does make more sense for it to be weak to water because it is a machine. And I'm clearly running out of things to say because I'm just talking absolute nonsense. And it's, 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 it's unimportant. I do like this Gatling gun attack though. That's very cool. It just sort of like sprays bullets at you. And you can see here I'm doing the thing where I time mug and the attack to get a chain off. And it just increases our damage from Yuna just a little bit. I've given Yuna mostly like strength building accessories just because I need to get as much damage out of her as possible. So that's why her attacks do so much damage. It shouldn't usually do that. Trying to time it with Holy Kogoro is a bit more difficult because there's the time it takes for her to cast it. But as soon as we get it down, it becomes pretty cool. And 4,000 damage you saw there is pretty nice and uh, I'm not threatened by this guy. It's just a big machine, we've already beaten it before. And honestly, it's a lot easier than the behemoth we just fought. So I'm cool, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good, I'm feeling grand. I'm also kind of getting bored of all the side content in this chapter. It is a lot of just like catching up with characters and seeing how their story ends. But I never really cared too much about most of the characters because uh, there was always so much other crazy stuff going on. And then there's just a bunch of random boss battles. Some are like extremely hard that you need to do like tons of grinding for. And some are just kind of easy like this one. And this is one of the easy ones, which is nice. Apologies for the people that prefer the sort of like commentary side of this more. The like memes and all the story stuff because this chapter is just like boss battle after boss battle. And of course we've got like the final boss battles at the end, which is quite a big section. So this one is a lot more like gameplay heavy than the other ones. But that is just the nature of the ending of the game. But um, yeah, I, I didn't tell you any strategy there because it's the same strategy we use for every boss fight with Dirty Dancing and Holy Kogoro. Now that this mission is done, I think it's finally time to confront the digging and upgrade the machine in the Jose Temple to level 5 so that we can beat it up and then get Payne's final dance move. And I forgot how tedious the digging is. You just have to go to like all these different spots, find the yellow X on the map, dig for it, hope that it gives you a really good uh, part that increases its abilities even more and not a crappy one. But it takes a long time. This probably took like more than half an hour, maybe 45 minutes. And it's just going backwards and forwards, saving it, finding the right part, running back again. And as you can see, my dog here makes it even more challenging because he's doing that thing where it just glitches out and it's like, ah, I just want this to be over with. Yeah, oh look, he's running in circles now and then he misses and the, the, the dog physics in this game, like what were they thinking? But we finally do it and then to get the last thing that we need, we have to do some chocobo breeding and I'm looking at the manual of what it says I need to do and I'm like, oh, that sounds like a lot. So 
I decided to just give up. We don't get the special dance for pain. I'm sorry, but it was just too much work to try and get it. Even after all that digging, it led to nothing. So let's just get on with the main story now. Searching, flapping, neighboring, gold wings, attack! Quiet! I have never in my life yelled a girl like this! We've jumped into the holes and are ready to head to the far plane to fight Vegna Gun and save the boys. But of course we have to go through the Dark Aeons again because we haven't killed all of them yet. And this is the next one we have against Shiva. And Shiva is a pretty cool Aeon. One of my favourites actually. I love her design. It's like the tiny body with the giant hair. It's very cool. She's very agile and just like fun to look at. Kogoro Blaze is actually our best friend in this fight. But we can't seem to land it because uh, Shiva has a lot of of evasion which means it is taking us a while to be able to hit her but we did equip Riku with an accessory that gives her blizzarga and also makes her absorb blizzard attack so she is immune to most of her damage which is lovely yeah there's not too much that Shiva can do to us her heavenly strike in the old game it used to delay us but in this game it reduces our HP and MP which is very very frustrating yeah as you can see here we are struggling a little bit to get hits out on her but luckily she isn't doing too much damage damage to us so we don't have to worry on that front it is just about trying to actually get her and dirty dancing is doing its wonders again and we're landing hits that are over 3000 damage so yuna is now like a boss ass you know she's really really putting in the work i should really be using some sort of dance or song that can boost our accuracy because we're just missing way too much with yuna that is a downside of the trainer the accuracy is rather low but even despite that Shiva, you can see, is starting to fall a little bit, which means she's about to die. And, of course, she does. So, um, yeah, that was the Shiva fight. And then I actually lost the rest of the footage from this run. So uh, I will try illustrate it as best as I can here. Do not fear, though. We did remember to start recording again towards the end of the game, so you haven't missed everything. But all my notes say from the lost footage is that we had a very long fight with the Mage's sisters, but they didn't do too much damage to us, and we beat them. Anima was super easy, and we ended up doing 999 damage with Holy Kagoro, and you're just going to have to take my word for it because there is absolutely no proof of that. And then LeBlanc says something about Nuge. I must report to Nuji Wuji at once. Nuji and then I was like, I can't be bothered to look up a walkthrough and how to do the note playing mini game. So we fight the Guardian and it destroys us. And I'm like, let me just try again. And it destroys us again. So I'm like, okay, I look up a walkthrough. And then I figure out how to do the puzzle. And then I saw that we had lost all the footage and decided to record again. So here we are in the final dungeon against Vegna Gun, And it is the Gullwing's job to fight the tail. And I won't show you the entire fight because there's a lot of fights in this last phase. And this is the easiest of the battles. And you'll see here when it uses this tail sweep attack it does tons of damage to us. But luckily, once we get Protect up, it does a whole lot less. So I'll show you here, we are using Kuraga to get our health back up, and then using Protect to make sure that we don't take too much damage. Luckily, this boss is very slow, and it doesn't do that tail attack very often. But now you can see there, with Protect, it's only doing 600 damage. So one more Holy Kogoro knocks it out. But then we have to move on to Vegna Gun's legs, because LeBlanc is incapable of doing it herself. So now it's time to go help LeBlanc out. I'll let you have this one. I'm going to go cheer Nuji on. <laughs> now we have the leg fight, and the leg fight is actually very difficult. Mainly because it just has four different components to it that can all attack you. So you're battling against four enemies that are very quick and just get a lot of attacks in quickly. You also can't reach the little orbs that are on the top unless you're using magic damage. And I soon realised there's just absolutely no point in that because it does barely anything. And you're best off just attacking the leg and pretending the orbs don't exist. They do, however, cast lots of healing spells. They cast Shell, they cast Haste. You can see someone's been petrified and is now dead. And this all just happens very quickly. And I'm like, whoa, I was not prepared. I also hadn't saved after the tail fight, which means I have to go through that again. And uh, yeah, we, we get a game over very quickly. 
So this time I'm like, okay, we're gonna do things differently. I beat the tail again, and then I run all the way out of the dungeon, back to the save point, save the game, and run forward to start the leg fight again. Of course we die again. <laughs> this guy's really, really difficult. But luckily this time I saved, and I decided to change my accessories around this time. We put Riku on a garment grid that gives her plus 15 defense and magic defense, and then I give Pain the crystal bangle, which just doubles her HP, meaning she will survive a bit better. And now we are ready to fight this guy once more. I removed the Shmoove Shaling from Pain, which is kind of unfortunate because Slow is actually very good for the song stress. And also being immune to her, I think, is great. But luckily in this fight, Vegna Gun's leg here helps us out a bit and casts Slow on Pain, which is a uh, very handy because it just means that she can now dance for much longer. I don't really know how but this time it just goes a lot smoother and we barely die at all. I think just increasing people's defences just made it so that we weren't dying and just meant that this fight became a lot easier. And of course they still get in a lot of attacks and things like that but we are just better equipped and more protected against their deadly attacks and yeah you can see there we're barely taking much damage and we're just quickly using Dirty Dancing and Holy Koguro to make work of the leg while Riku heals us up. Same as we do every other fight. I'll rush forward to the end here so that you can see that we kill the leg without much issue. We'll finish it. Do it. The torso is next and we have this voice telling us what to do and it sounds very familiar. This time the legs are just a distraction. You know where to strike. I'm pretty sure that's Oren's voice, and I don't really know why you can hear Oren's voice. He kind of chimes in and out during these last battles, and it's really cool. At first I was like, is that Nuge talking to you? But that, I'm pretty sure that is Oren's voice. But we never see Oren, we never like have any hints towards him. He just speaks to us for some reason in these last fights. It's a cool little detail, but I'm just not quite sure why that happens. I saw someone uh, in a comment on another video say that it was Jet's voice. And I don't hear it. I, I hear Auron for some reason. So in this battle, he only ever attacks us whenever we attack him. So if you use magic on him, he will attack your MP. And if you attack him with physical attacks, he will just counter attack with a physical attack of his own. Eventually, he does do this thing where he gets on all fours and lifts himself in the air, charging an attack. And this is where we need to be careful because this is when he can do some scary damage. Luckily the counter attacks aren't too bad and if we don't want him to hurt us we just don't attack until we get ourselves back to normal again. But yeah here comes his big attack which does a ton of damage to us but not enough to kill us. And what's nice about this is if we are low on HP we can just stop attacking to make sure that he won't attack us. And yeah as you can see we're all on low health so this is the perfect time to start healing ourselves up. I'm actually making use of some of our items now. Now that it's towards the end and I'm like, okay, I've barely used items at all. So I'm making sure to use mega potions when we run out of MP and things like that. I also use my mega elixirs and uh, just to get everyone back to their normal MP because Yuna can use some powerful techniques and it just makes sense to use a mega elixir. It just heals up everybody's MP and HP. And as you can see there, Yuna has now learned Pound, which is her final ability as a trainer so that's quite nice we got her final ability here in the final few fights and it's actually a very strong ability and i wish i had this throughout the rest of the game holy kogoro is fine but pound just seems to do more damage and it's like her ultimate move she summons like every single dog in the world to come and attack them it's very camp it's very stupid like where do all these dogs come from and why is that an ability to just summon a bunch of dogs i thought yuna's summoning days were over but apparently she can muster up dogs from thin air but whatever, it looks cool to, to do it. So um, Pound becomes our new damage technique. Holy Koguro is out of the picture and it's all about Pound. This guy is not giving us as much trouble as the legs were. I found the legs a lot more difficult because they would just attack you non-stop. Whereas this one, you can kind of choreograph it. He does a lot of healing spells on his legs, but we ain't even bothering with the legs. We don't even touch them. The amount of times he casts regen on them for absolutely no reason because... um. Regen doesn't do anything. Once you've already got regen, you've got regen. And I'm not attacking them, so they're not losing health anyway. So it's nice that they're wasting a lot of turns doing that. They do like to put status ailments on you, like Doom and Bio and Petrify. We do get quite lucky a lot of the time and the Petrify doesn't hit us, but Doom does and Poison does. 
Luckily they're a bit easier to deal with than, the, than Petrify. So we just have to make sure we are removing that whenever we can. Not having the Shmoof Shaling means that we actually do not protect against those anymore, which is kind of sad, but the boost in HP was definitely needed for Pain. Because uh, she was dying quite frequently, and now she has like the highest health than any of the characters, which is nice. He is now dead, and nobody even died in that fight. That was nice and easy. And I thought that was it. I thought we could now fight Barrelai, but nope, apparently we have to go and fight the head now. Auron is still talking to us, and this happens quite a lot, and I don't understand why they don't explain this part. I guess they just sort of leave it to your interpretation that, like, Yuna is hearing Auron's voice in her head, and it's giving her the strength to do this. But, like, we didn't hear anything of Auron the entire game, so why does he just show up in Yuna's head now? But, anyway... Now that Vegna Gun is powered up, I guess, or is getting desperate, it's shooting out its giant gun from its mouth, and what is that? This is like the most Japanese thing ever, and I love it. It's it's very cool. It's just this giant gun coming out of this like bug-looking robot. Like who thinks of this? And the answer is Square does. And uh, I'll admit, as silly as Vegna Gun is, and the sort of like MacGuffin that he is. Is that what it's called? A MacGuffin, which is like a random plot point used to give everyone urgency. Despite just being like a MacGuffin to have a cool robot without really making much sense, it does look kind of cool. It's very like beast like while also being robotic, while also being kind of like bug like and creature like, and it's got a cool design. I wish we got to see more of Vegna Gun rather than just in like little cutscenes. Then I guess it's kind of cool to keep the anticipation going. You kind of just see him in these little cutscenes, little glimpses of him without ever actually seeing it until the final moments. And I guess that's kind of cool. I'll give the game props for that. Is it as cool as Sin though? I don't think so. Sin had more of a presence, whereas like this is literally a machine. I don't understand why Barrelai is playing the piano on his head or what that has to do with anything. What does that have to do with anything? And even like the final dungeon that you guys missed because I lost the footage, it's like all music based and I'm like, huh? Why? Is that because Yuna is a singer or because Len or because... I, the, the story of this game does still kind of confuse me. I still don't really know who Shu Yin is and why he wants to destroy the world. I know that he was a Blitz player and he was in love with Len who was a pop star, but why does he want to kill everyone? Is it because people tried to kill him? Because he tried to expose Yevon for having this giant monster, so now he's dead? He's like, well I'm gonna use this giant monster to kill the world so I can find Len again. I don't really know. It does kind of take away from these final moments, because it's like, oh, big scary boss battle, but I'm still unsure on what we're doing, what the mission is and what the goal is. I realise I've not said anything about the fight, so I'm just going to get into that real quick. This iteration is actually fairly difficult and takes a bit longer, and that's mainly because he just does a lot of things, you know? It's hard to predict what he's going to do, he just chucks out big scary attacks and status ailments constantly. So, as you know, we are doing the usual pound, dirty dancing, healing off our status ailments, blah 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 blah, you guys get the point. I, I don't want to drag this on too much. I know it's the final fight, but you guys can see what is happening on screen. And this video is getting very long just because there are several boss battles in this. And this is the time where we are using all of our potions, using all of our techniques, using everything that we've learned throughout this game to defeat the... <laughs> the Vegna Gun. That's what it's called, Vegna Gun. Um, cool name, Vegna Gun. Like, I might name my firstborn kid that. And it's- oh, And a gun comes out of him. I guess that's why they call him Vegna Gun. I have the mind of a mastermind. What's that? I don't know, but you know, I'm so creative like that. <laughs> that's probably the gun part. Okay, that attack, that, that, that attack did a lot of damage. Uh, we all, oh, we nearly die. That's quite scary. I think I panicked at this moment because I'm like, oh my god, thank god they used Demi. And thank god I have some Mega Phoenixes still left because uh, that could have been dangerous. Although, annoying thing, in Final Fantasy X, the Mega Phoenixes would bring you back to full health. Whereas in this game, they don't do that. So I'm like, oh god, I'm going to die. We get very lucky though. He uses a lot of status ailment attacks as well as like Demi. So like all things that can't actually kill us. And we managed to get enough turns in to heal up. Because I swear to god, if he had killed us in that moment and we had to start all the way again, 
from the tail. When I beat the tail and saved it, we'd have to start from the leg fight again. If I had to do that, I would have thrown my controller on the floor and been like, you know what, we're just going to try this challenge again tomorrow. Because at this point, I'm at that stage where I've been fighting a long time, I lost a bit of footage, I'm already getting a bit like delirious and crazy, and I just kind of want it to be over. Yeah, it would have been nice if there was like a save point between each of these fights, but I get it, they want it to be a challenge, so they want you to have to go through it all again to make you remember it a bit more because you would have had to have done it a million and one times. I don't remember struggling with this fight when I was younger or when I played this game before and I think it's just because I used really broken dress spheres like the psychic or the dark knight or the gun mage or you know all of those really good ones whereas uh, I'm using these terrible ones and I guess this is where the challenge is it's just uh, dying lots but like I've said the the way that this challenge became a lot simpler was just by thinking about our defense more than anything, especially with Riku and Pain. Allowing Yuna to just be the solo damage dealer was like the best decision I made. And focusing on increasing people's HP and defenses just meant that I had more survivability because um, dying in this game is terrible. Once you die, when you're revived, you're revived on very little health and then you're, it's a scramble to try to get back to full again. So if you just make sure they never die, you can make sure that you are winning more frequently, I suppose. And Pound is just doing work. I love watching all these dogs. It kind of like ruins the vibe of this fight. It's very dark and mysterious and like end of the world. And then you have like a bunch of dogs just like scratching at his mouth and that does damage apparently. So um, yeah, people were scared of this giant monster that could destroy the world. Uh, it's okay, about 10 dogs are all you need to defeat it. So yeah. I'm going to skip forward towards the end here because I think you've seen enough of the fight and I think you are getting the hint that we are the best. So yeah, a few more attacks come in, a few more deaths, a bit of drama and we destroy the head. Yeah, let's have the you are not led! Now this is the final fight of the game against Shu Yin and he does all of the same attacks that Tidus does. And I don't know if these characters are actually linked in any way or they just look similar, but like why does he have the exact same moveset as Tidus? And I guess it's because they didn't want to build a new model and they just wanted to reuse Tidus's old moves. It is quite cool to see Tidus's old attacks again, but yeah this fight is actually very easy. The only thing we have an issue with is this like Blitz Ace attack, which isn't called Blitz Ace, it's called like Xanakin's End or something, I don't know. That's the only thing that does a big amount of damage and almost certainly KOs anyone he targets, no matter what. But aside from that, the fight is not hard. He only ever uses physical attacks, so we just use Protect and we're like pretty sound. And then we're just using Pound over and over again until he dies. I'm not going to show you all of this fight, I know it's the final fight and it takes away from the drama of it all. But like there really is not much to say about this. It's very easy. It's kind of like the Yu Yevon fight in Final Fantasy X where it's not actually a difficult fight. It's not designed for you to die in. It's like Vegna Gun was the hard fight and this is just like the end story fight to um, tie things up and have a sort of dramatic ending. So yeah, Shu Yin is now dead and we get the ending. A thousand years and this moment is all we get? This is the first time we actually hear Len speak, and I'm pretty sure it's the same voice actor as Belgamino. I don't need anything else. Destroy Sin and save Spira. Just knowing how you feel is enough. Stop. That is enough. Now that Len and Shuyin have been reunited, they can finally disappear together. And although Yuna cannot be with her love, at least she helped someone else. And that ends chapter 5, finishing the game. And the ending is very similar to Final Fantasy X, but instead of Yuna giving a speech to everyone, it's the Jonas Brothers of Spira. And they're talking about being a boat. Uh, Nuja's a boat, and Barilai is a boat, and they all want people in them because that's what people do on boats. They sit on them, and they want people to sit on their face. That is what I'm getting from this speech. It's a lot less heartfelt than Final Fantasy X, I'll be honest. But basically they're just saying, hey, 
we were enemies when we shouldn't have been and now we're friends again so everyone else can be friends again right we're sorry that we were cult leaders and we led you all into fighting each other we've all decided to be friends and let's all just be happy peace and love peace and love which is hey it's a good ending i guess everyone is happy vegna gun is gone so everyone can just chill out i will say i'm over these boys the, they didn't bring much to this game but i will say they did a great job with yuna like despite her growth she is still herself and that, i think that shows in the ending in Final Fantasy X, Yuna was very selfless and did everything for everyone else. And in this game, she kind of decides to do things for herself. But in the end, she is still her and she is still a selfless person. Hence why she helped Len and Shuyin unite again. Because she knows the pain of not being with your loved one. And if she can't be with hers, at least she can help someone else be with theirs. And that just shows that despite her growth and change in attitude, she is still her at her core. Despite not being the cinematic masterpiece that Final Fantasy X was, it still has a poignant point to make about Yuna and hey the game is fun i had a fun time playing this game i'm not gonna lie to you the battle system is very enjoyable and i kind of ruined that by doing this challenge and having really boring terrible dress spheres but when you play this game properly and you get invested with the dress spheres and the battle system and everything that it has to offer it is actually an enjoyable experience so if you're a fan of final fantasy and you like 10 i would definitely give this game a go but um just don't use the bad dress spheres. Use, use Psychic, use Dark Knight, use all the really cool fun ones. Don't bother with these. I wish they would make a 10 free. I'm going to be honest, they might ruin the story. I've heard there's an audiobook that like completely destroys the story. But we'll just pretend that doesn't exist. And let's continue the story. Or, you know what I would actually like? A prequel where it's Jet, Braska and Auron all together trying to like defeat Sin and seeing like a young Yuna and a young Kamari and like seeing Spira in the past when it's like less hopeful and you know having to get the final A on and all of that. That's what I would really like. If they ever want to continue the story I think a prequel is the way to go. I would play that game. But let me know in the comments what you guys think. Should they continue the story with a 10 free or give us a prequel or just leave the series where it is. Just accept these two games as the canon and just leave the story there. If you guys have enjoyed this series please do not forget to like, comment and subscribe. These videos take a very long time and they are extremely fun to make and I love seeing all the comments but if you do appreciate this series and you want me to make more YouTube now has an option to give tips so if you are in a position where you can give a tip then leave a tip underneath. You don't have to I'm not expecting anything but if you have been on this journey with me and enjoyed it and have the money to spare then hey go ahead and leave your boy a tip. Yeah thank you guys so so much for watching. My name has been Jamsack. See you guys next time. This is my story. It'll be a good one. Ah, uh, I think the f not, you trick ass bitch.